the number one place on the internet to learn about YouTube, network with other content creators, and have an awesome time doing it. My name is Nick, and today I'm answering your YouTube questions. But look, if you're listening to the podcast version of this or if you're watching on the replay, I do want to let you know that on YouTube, we do have the timestamps that we add to this after the stream is finished so that you can jump down into the video description, see the different questions that were asked so that you can just jump to any information that you might care about the most. And if you are listening to this on any of the podcast platforms, Make sure that you do give this, uh, you know, a lot of stars or whatever the thing is on whichever platform it is that you are listening on. So uh, if this is your first time here, I do want to let you know that um, uh, that the questions that we ask on this stream um, are brought to you by you the people that are hanging out watching the stream right now. So in order to get your question asked, all you have to do if this is your first time here, it's all free. Thanks to our sponsors, TubeBuddy and StreamYard, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But all you have to do is go down into the description of this stream right now, and there's a form down there, and you can put your question into that form. And then I answer them in the order that they're received here uh, on the stream. So with all that stuff out of the way, I do want to let you know that this stream is brought to you by TubeBuddy, which is the number one tool for YouTube content creators. TubeBuddy helps you optimize your videos for discovery, helps you uh, make sure that the thumbnails that you are using are effective for the people that you're trying to to reach and that you are performing the best in the traffic sources or the pages on YouTube that you're trying to get the attention from. In addition to that, they have a bunch of other tools that can help you as a content creator, over 90 different tools to help you with what it is that you're doing on YouTube. You can try it out for yourself at tubebuddy.com slash nim. And I've got a link to that down in the description. And our stream is co-brought to you by StreamYard, which is the live streaming platform that I use to stream this every Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern. And the reason that I use StreamYard is because it's easy. Two, it holds the stream open for me. So if I have any tech problems or anything like that, it keeps it all open for me so I can come back in on my phone or it just gives me time to restart everything. In addition to that, they make it really easy to bring on guests when I want to. They make it really easy to add graphics to the screen, to add background music. You can even play videos while you are live streaming, which is fantastic. You can share your screen, you can share slides, all kinds of amazing features with StreamYard. But if you are a live streamer, you should definitely check StreamYard out at StreamYard.com. And of course, I've got a link to that as well as a bunch of other helpful tools and resources for you down in the description as well. Now, with all of that out of the way, Hope that you are ready to learn about some YouTube stuff today. As you can tell, today I am here rolling solo. Uh, my brother D and Daniel Batal, they have a live stream happening over on the StreamYard YouTube channel after this stream is complete. As soon as this stream comes to an end, it's going to send you directly over there so you can just sit back, relax. You don't even have to do anything. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, you'll be able to join their stream as soon as that is complete as well. So... I'm going to go ahead and just start getting into the uh, questions here. But before I do, um, I'm going to just pop out a preview link here. And then I'm going to drop this link right here in the chat. So if you are wanting to get your question answered, make sure that you get it into the form that I just dropped into the chat. No question is too silly or too new or too, you know, out, out there, so to speak. So if you do have something that you're trying to figure out, some trouble that you're having with your channel or something like that, um, it can be anything related to creating content in YouTube. Just go Go ahead and drop it in that form and um, and we'll get it answered here on the stream today. So um, really quick, Creator Classroom says, I hope the cough is finally gone for you. I had to cut my stream short yesterday because of my coughing fit. Kind of comes and goes right now. Um, it's on the way out. It's almost finished, but um, it comes and goes. So it seems like if I'm in a really cold environment, then the cough will come back. Uh, but uh, uh, most of the time it is perfectly fine. But of course, you know, I've got my mug here. I've got water in it today, just so for the fact of, uh, you know, using that in the event that my throat does get kind of dried out because I keep it pretty chilly in here. So absolutely, um, you know, thinking about that too, but I'm glad, uh, well, I'm not glad that your, that your cough is, uh, you know, bad, but, uh, but, but, uh, I hope that you recover quickly. So, uh, let's hear. So the very first question that we have, um, is from Nero soup, Nero soup. Um, they upload one time per week or more. The type of channel is art education. The goal of the channel is I help artists and 
I help artists succeed and build my personal brand as an artist. And the question is, I'm pivoting a 140,000 subscriber channel. I started in 2007 from drug education to art education. And old drug videos have been unlisted for four months, only art now. My channel's doing really bad. Do you think that it would help if I change my channel name to something art related? How much does channel name actually matter when you're trying to show up in search or suggested? So when it comes to your channel name, it really doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it, it matters if you start getting into the extreme new. So let's say, for example, you are, you know, like if I'm at a coffee shop and I'm trying to tell my brother D about your YouTube channel because I ran across it and I thought it was amazing. In that particular case, it would be helpful if it was easy for me to remember so that I could be like, oh, hey, it's this channel, right? But when you start adding numbers to it and things like that, it starts getting complicated. So just trying to have a channel name that's just easy to uh, remember, that can be advantageous. But the most important thing to remember here is that when you are publishing videos to YouTube, um, it can be long form videos or shorts, whatever, the, the videos themselves are gonna be the thing that does it for you. So it doesn't matter what your channel name is, when people click on the video, the experience that they get from that video is going to be the thing that is one, um, going to determine if they're gonna you know, subscribe and come back and watch more and all of that. But it's also, um, that experience is also going to determine the performance of those videos on YouTube. So one thing that you might be running into is if you are coming back into this after having 140,000 subscribers that have gained since 2007, and you haven't really, you know, been uploading, you know, tons of content, you know, um, within that time, then in that particular case, it's just a totally different game now. So back in 2012, um, YouTube switched to the primary metric um, of measurement in terms of uh, viewer satisfaction to watch time. So because of that, um, it's just a totally different game now. And of course, you know, from 2007 to now, um, there's been, you know, tons of content creators in every genre that have come onto the platform. And because of that, it's competitive here now, right? I mean, it's it's been competitive, but it's really competitive here now. So because of that, um, the thing that I recommend that you do is that you do spend the most time coming up with the video ideas, trying to come up with something you know unique or something that just isn't completely over talked about in your space. Um, in addition to that, trying to come up with you know. Uh, 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 videos that are something to where people are like, oh yeah, you know, this is, you know, clear from the outside. This has something to do with art. Um, and it has something that will add some type of value to me. Therefore I'm going to click on it. And then they come into that video and they have a good experience. So I'm not sure how much you've dug in since you've, you know, um, been, you know, kind of bringing everything back on your channel, but YouTube gives us audience retention reports now for our videos so we can see second by second how people are responding to what it is that we're doing. We can see click-through rate info. We can see click-through rate and audience retention or the, the average percentage viewed and average view duration and total watch time coming from all the different pages of YouTube. Like we got tons of information now. So start using that information to start gauging how people are responding to your content. Because, you know, keep in mind when it comes to YouTube itself, the job of the platform is to show the right videos to the right people at the right time that they're the most likely to enjoy. So because of that, our job as content creators is to make the content the best that we possibly can so that when viewers come into our content, they have a good experience. And if they have a good experience with our content, then YouTube is gonna find other people on the platform that use YouTube like they do, that are interested in the similar things that they are, and they are going to present our content to them. And then from there, if we can get them to click on our videos and come in and enjoy the videos, then in that particular case, they're gonna show it to more people and so on. So because of that, just make sure that you are rolling up your sleeves and you're really digging into like, okay, how can I make the best possible content for people that are into art education, people that are trying to learn about art, people that are trying to, you know, just get the most that they can out of, you know, whatever it is that they're doing with their art. So um, also keep in mind, like, and I know this is going to be a tough one, you, trust me, um, but, you know, you have 140,000 subscriber channel, so I understand the desire to go back to that channel. But if you grow 140,000 subscribers on something on like drug education, and then you're switching it over to art, um, it's a pretty wildly different group of people that you're trying to reach. So because of that, you might want to start something new, like you can pivot channels without question, but you know, it can, it can take some time. So if you're doing it just so that you can hold on to that number, um, it's important to know that that particular number, it doesn't really mean a lot on YouTube. I mean, it does, right. There's like brands will look at you differently. Um, you know, uh, you know, some viewers will look at you differently once they realize, you know, that you have those higher subscriber counts and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, the thing that really matters and that matters the most when it comes to YouTube is are people enjoying, are they clicking on it at a competitive rate? And are they enjoying it at a competitive rate for the platform? If the answer is yes, then you'll continue getting views on that content. If the answer is no, then that content, when you publish it, it'll just kind of dry out, right? So uh, so that's the, that's the thing. 
So uh, really quick, I just want to, oh man, did I just close that? I hope not. There we go. So uh, really quick, uh, Clementia, what's going on? Says I'm back from Thailand so I can watch Nick do live again. That's awesome. Oh, you're in Thailand. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, you were back in Thailand. Fantastic. Yeah, you should uh, hit me up when you are here. Um, Chantel, what's going on? Welcome to the stream. Hope you're doing fantastic. Home Rapid Repair, what's going on? Hope you're doing great. Jerry Popandria, nice to see you in here. Creator Classroom, hope that you are doing fantastic as well. So uh, the next question that we have, and by the way, if you are just joining us, the, the questions that I'm answering are pulled from the form that is down in the description right now. So all you have to do to get your question answered is just go down into the description, click on that form, and then just go fill out your go fill out your question. I ask like what your goals are for the channel and things like that so I can give you the best advice, you know, from my experience. And then um, from there, you know, that's all it. Like you don't have to, you know, uh, you know, pay or anything like that in order to get your question answered. Thanks to our sponsors. Scully's House of Thrillers. Thanks for your support for 53 months, dude. Super appreciate it. Neuro Soup, my pleasure. So next up on our list here, uh, we've got One Step. Uh, One Step uploads every other day. They do fighting games. Um, the goal of the channel is to turn my skills and knowledge into a fun and profitable career. And the question is, good morning, my dudes. Uh, we'll just say my dude today, but hey, if D's watching, then you know that we'll pass that on to him too. <laughs> but it says, um, uh, who do I get to pay to get more gamer style background music and creator mix? Um, uh, I appreciate all you guys do. Um, on a real note, I've been going vertically live pretty often, well as often as I can, and it's been amazing for exposure and growth. Um, streams are getting ten to fifty thousand views, and I'll usually grow around fifty to two hundred subscribers per stream. But I've noticed an uh, an odd anomaly while vertically streaming. It truly seems to be an actual algorithm because 20 to 30 minutes, I get a massive spike in views for about 10 minutes. Then it goes back down to about 20 to 40 viewers. Then 20 minutes later, it jumps up to three to 400. My question is, do you know why? I mean, the audience was enjoying it like uh, most of them are. Uh, wouldn't, it wouldn't it stay? So here's the thing. So uh, first off, we've got a video coming out about how to do vertical live streaming that's coming out um, tomorrow, um, just as a heads up you know, for that. In addition to that, um, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to, you know, those influxes, I've noticed that same exact thing. I'm actually getting ready to go live vertically right now, um, actually as well. But basically when, um, when we are publishing content, right. And YouTube is showing it to people, even if those people are enjoying it, of course we have, uh, oh, I'm just going to do mobile here, make this easier. No, I can't do it on that one. So we're just going to roll with that and take that away but basically when um when you are you know publishing videos to youtube as long as people are enjoying it youtube is going to oh no youtube is going to uh you know show it to the right people and all of that good stuff but the the problem is there we go the problem is when you are um you know live streaming the amount of time people are spending in your live streams might not be enough. So in that particular case, if people are hanging out in your live streams, but uh, or not really hanging out, but if people are coming in like they do on mine to where people will come in, they'll be there for you know a handful of minutes or whatever, um, and then, or really a minute or two minutes, and then they bounce, that just might not be enough for YouTube. So then because of that, maybe it lowers down a little bit, and then maybe you have people come in that are engaged a little bit more, so it tries those groups. That's kind of my guess on what's happening. Um, we don't have any information on how any of that stuff works yet. Um, so because of that, that's just kind of like a stab in the dark based on how everything else works on the platform. Like when people are enjoying it you know, the most, then they keep showing it to more people, and then when that kind of falters a little bit, then, you know, they'll show it to less. And then if they do find those groups of people that will enjoy it, even if something's been on the platform for a while, then in that particular case, then, you know, you'll see those, you know, boosts coming in uh, for that. So uh, let's see here. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying something today. So basically, I'm, I'm going live vertical um, through StreamYard here. And I'm also um, going live here in landscape mode as well. And the fun thing with this is I'm actually just trying to get this preview up um, because I've got right now, um, I've got it to where I can see the chat. So I'm trying to just get the chat up here. There we go. I think I might have, uh, I think I might have just got it. Boom. Okay. So yeah, so now I've got the uh, chat showing up. I got this Elgato uh, prompter thing. So basically now I can see uh, this here as well, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So I can see some of the comments coming in from the uh, vertical too. All right, good. All right, so back on track here. Brian G. Johnson in the house. What's up, my dude? Hope that you are doing fantastic. Nice to, uh, nice to see you in here today. Brian G. Johnson, 
All right, so let's get back on uh, track here. Let me see if I can get my mouse back on the screen, and we can. Okay, got it. So next question that we have, and by the way, if you are just joining us, the questions um, are answered in the order that they are received. I have the form that is down in the description. Oh, it looks like that is putting like a cloud on the screen. Look at that. I guess I'd have to do dark mode if I'm going to do that. Okay, so we're going to take that off then. Okay, so we're just going to roll with this then. Okay, so be it. Jedi. All right. Boom. So um, let's see here. So let's get back on track. So the next question that we have here is from Jay's Place. Jay's Place uploads when they have time. They've been on YouTube for one year or more. They do random videos. The goal of the channel is to have a good time. And the question is, um, how do you make and sell merch? Um, great question. So when it comes to merch, uh, the easy way to do it is use Spreadshop. Um, it, the reason you want to use Spreadshop is because they deliver internationally. Some of them do not. So if you have viewers that are watching from all over the world, which as a YouTube content creator, you do, then in that particular case, you want to make sure that if somebody buys something that they're going to be able to you know, receive it. Um, so uh, with Spreadshop, they ship internationally, plus the quality of the products they put out is also good. So uh, Spreadshop.com is where you'd want to go for that. And then in terms of making the merch, and that's free, by the way. So you go to Spreadshop and you create an account over there. And then all you have to do to make the merch is you need to upload a design. So the real hurdle that you're going to have is coming up with a design. So what you need to do is in order for the uh, design is find an app that'll let you design, um, maybe hop onto canva.com, you know, you get, use like a free account or something like that somewhere um, and make a design or hop on Fiverr and pay somebody five or 10 bucks to make you a really good looking design. Um, and then you can just upload those to Spreadshop and then you can tell their website, you can say, hey, I, I want to put this on coffee mugs. I want to put it on hoodies. I want to put it on t-shirts and pillows, whatever it is you want to put it on, you just check those boxes and then um, you can go in and do some customization and then it's ready to go. From there, the next thing you can do is um, with your Spreadshop account, you'll also get a store. So with that store, what you can do is you can take the link for that store and you can copy it and then you can put that link down in your description. And then when you're telling people about your merch, you're like, hey, check this out. You can get it down in the description. Um, then they can just go down there and click that link. So even if you are not in the YouTube partner program yet, even if you don't have the qualifications in order to put the, you know, the, the, the merch underneath your videos, then people can still go down to the video description and click on it there and then you can still make money that way. Great question. Uh, next up, we got English Fun Zone. English Fun Zone uploads one time per week or more. Educational content. The goal of the channel is to make videos that help students learn English and do YouTube full time. The question is: I've noticed that you don't post your live stream notice until the day of. Why? Is there any? Is there a way to post them a day before? Yeah. So I could schedule them in advance. Um, every now and then I do, but it doesn't seem like it really impacts the viewership on my channel when I do it in advance. So because of that, I'm just like, oh, I'll just do it the day of. Sometimes I'll do it just right before I go live. Um, and that's just so that people can come in and, you know, start, you know, hanging out and all that stuff. Cause I know some people are kind of waiting for us to go live. So because of that, I do it, you know, it, I try to do it an hour ahead of time so that, you know, so that as people are coming in, they can, you know, they can chat and hang out and, you know, stuff like that. But for me personally, um, the reason I don't schedule them, you know, really far out is because it, it doesn't seem to make a difference on my channel. Now, when I do them on like the, the other channels, um, you know, if I stream on like StreamYard or TubeBuddy or Tube Spanner, if I stream on those channels, then in that particular, case, um, you know, the scheduling in advance helps a little bit. But like, again, on the StreamYard channel, not a ton on the TubeBuddy channel, not so much. The TubeSpanner channel is smaller. So because of that one, you know, it does help a little bit there if it's scheduled um, in advance. But even with that, like the last time I went live there, I scheduled it, um, I think, a week in advance or not a week, I think four days in advance. And, um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it still, you know, didn't get, you know, that much viewership on it. So, you know, because of that, you know, I, I just don't do it that much in advance. But if I was like really being adamant about I want as many people as possible to be in this stream, um, then in that case, I would schedule it in advance just to give myself that advantage. Because, you know, when it comes to all this stuff, anything that you can do, like if you're in that phase where you're like, hey, I'm just trying to get, you know, attention on my stuff right now, any of the little details that you can do to create that advantage for yourself is a win. And nothing is a waste of time um, in that situation. But, um, but you know, right now, the these streams for me, these are more about, you know, certain Serving the serving you guys, the people that are already interacting with the content. Um, these aren't necessarily designed to grow the channel. Now, with that said, I am streaming vertically right now as well. 
what's going on vertical folks. So I'm streaming vertically right now as well. And um, with that stream, it's going to be showing up in front of some people that haven't interacted with my content before. And uh, with them, you know, some of them might end up subscribing or clicking on my name to figure out what my channel's about and go, you know, see more content and things like that. So, uh, so with that, that one is a, is a different purpose compared to, uh, you know, compared to this one, even though the content's the same. So two spanner in the house. Thanks for the super chat. Super chat says, um, we started a channel about how to make uh, great camouflage last month. It's really frustrating. Even though the content is great, nobody can find it. <laughs> nice. Nobody can see it. Would have been a, would have been a good landing on that. <laughs> oh, love it. So uh, next up on our list here, we've got um, Crafts Unleashed by Robin. They upload one time per week or more. Um, they do DIY crafts content and home decor content. The goal of the channel is to share my love of crafting and to inspire others in their crafting. And uh, the question is, has someone uh, changed with the recommendation system? My impressions have gone down all of a sudden since February 1st. So here's what happens is YouTube system is constantly updating. So basically, it's not like, hey, there's this one change, and then now all of a sudden everything's different. Their system is, is learning in real time. So basically, how things work is the content that is the most competitive, that's going to rise to the top. The content that isn't as competitive, that is not going to rise to the top. So... So every day people are publishing new videos. Some of those videos are more competitive than others. And because of that, sometimes you can have a couple of really good videos go out and, you know, your viewers will end up getting presented those videos more because they're just really good videos. But in terms of just overall impressions being down, make sure that you're publishing, you know, like you normally do, go and check your traffic sources report and you'll be able to see because there's a line graph, right? So you can say, okay, let's let's uh, push this back to um, the last 90 days. And then that way, since it happened on February 1st, Let's go back the last 90 days and then just look at that uh, bar graph for your tra or the line graph for your traffic sources and you'll see the fall off point. Like where did the, where did you know the impressions go down um, as long as you choose the impression option um, and you'll see that. And then from there, you'll be able to see, OK, was did I lose traffic from home pages? Did I lose traffic from suggested videos Did I lose traffic from search? Is that what happened? Um, because, you know, some things that can uh, happen is like, let's say that you have um, a video that's getting a lot of traffic from another video. Well, if something happens happens to where that video isn't as competitive anymore or wherever that video is getting a majority of its traffic from that isn't competitive anymore, but you were getting a lot of, you know, suggested views from them, or maybe you're in that up next spot, then in that particular case, um, you know, you would, you, that, that hit that they took would also ripple down. Right. So, uh, so because of that, there's just a lot of moving parts and, um, and it's not necessarily, even though you're going to see videos to where it says YouTube just changed their algorithm, blah, blah. Like it's, it's just happening in real time, um, all the time. So, you know, yes, they push updates and things like that. But when it comes to, you know, your channel being impacted, um, most of the most of the time, it comes down to the choices that we're making um, against all of the other competition that we have. Um, another thing to always remember as a YouTube content creator is when you're publishing videos to YouTube, you're not just competing with the other people in your niche. You're competing with everybody or every piece of content that YouTube thinks is a good fit for your viewers. So, you know, let's say you make uh, gaming content. Then in that particular case, uh, if gamers often watch, you know, uh, like South Park or something, and because of that, YouTube is showing a lot of those clips and people respond to that, then in that particular case, you're also competing with those. If gamers typically watch Joe Rogan, then you're also competing with Joe Rogan. If gamers typically listen to classical music, then maybe you're also going to, you know, compete with some classical music as well, because, you know, YouTube has determined that the people that are interacting with your content also like that kind of stuff. So you literally compete with everything that your, your viewers are likely to enjoy. I mean, you can see it for yourself. If you just open up your YouTube homepage, then you can see, you know, like, hey, they're showing me like a wide range of things here. Um, that's all the stuff, right, that you're, uh, I'm not saying that's the stuff that you're competing with, but that's a demonstration of you know, like YouTube is just showing you that random stuff. They do that with everybody. Um, so because of that, you know, it could also be that you are just not being as competitive now as you were, you know, previously, because that happens too. Um, oh, there's also seasonality. Um, let me mention that real quick. So, you know, like there's seasonality. So like, let's say that you have like, you know, sports content. Well, in that particular case, you know, if, if that sport is over for the season or whatever, then, you know, the viewership and that can go down. Um, let's say that, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say that, um, you know, there, there's an interest change. So if I mention gaming again, so let's say that, um, okay, so we, so if you play Fortnite, then you know that the new Fortnite just dropped uh, today. 
last night today depending on where you're at but the new Fortnite just came out so because of that let's say that they made a lot of really bad decisions and i don't think so like i'm having fun with it so far but let's say that they made a lot of really bad decisions and people are like you know what i'm not going to play that anymore i'm going to go play something else you know until the next season comes out well in that particular case what's going to happen is the people that are making Fortnite videos they might see a dip in the activity that they have on their channel um for now and then if Fortnite fixes that in the future and then it ends up being better than in that particular case, um, you know, then those people might come back to Fortnite. And then if you're making Fortnite content, then, you know, that might br kind of bring it back to life. So there's that type of thing, too, because interests change, right? Interests change over time. So Crafts Unleashed by Robin is our next channel here. Uh, they upload one time per week or more. They do DIY and uh, home decor content, DIY crafts and home decor. The goal of the channel is to share my love of crafting and to inspire others in their crafting. The question is, has something changed? Oh, already got that one. Okay, so next up. So we're on number six right now. Um, we've got EP Videos Diecast Racing. They've been on uh, YouTube for a year or more. The type of channel is racing modified Hot Wheel cars. The goal of the channel is to make a full-time income for my family. And the question is, when is it a good time to reach out to sponsors and what's the best, best method for landing a contract for them? So the best method for landing the contract is to, you know, understand them and what they're trying to accomplish, you know, as much as you possibly can. Um, because then, you know, if you hop on a call with them and you, you know, basically figure out what it is that they're trying to do or where you can kind of fit in and how you can, you know, leverage your channel to also help them accomplish their goals while also bringing some type of value to your viewers through that, you know, through that deal, then in that particular case, um, you know, you should be able to work something out in terms of, you know, a good time to reach out to sponsors. Um, there is such a thing as, uh, as micro influencers. And those are people that, you know, just have smaller channels. And the good thing about micro influencers is they typically have, you know, really engaged communities. Like if they're getting decent view counts, but the channels aren't that big yet, um, they typically have really engaged communities. And with those really engaged communities, it's also easy for the content creator to just recognize people and things like that, because, you know, it's a lot of the same people that are coming and interacting. So it really helps, you know, a lot of people stand out and it creates those kind of deeper relationships with that, you know, initial crowd. So, uh, so when it comes to brand deals, like a lot of brands really like those, you know, situations, but there is a content creator that I would love for you to follow. His name is Justin Moore. He has a YouTube channel called the creator wizard. Um, the creator wizard, the entire thing is about brand deals. It'll help you avoid pitfalls. It'll help you know the right choices to make. It'll help you know the conversations, the very specific conversations that you need to have. Um, it lets you know, you know, ballparks of, you know, what to charge and all kinds of things like that. But it's called the creator wizard. Um, he is amazing. Um, Justin is, he's extremely knowledgeable and, um, and he is very well, he has very good intentions when it comes to, you know, trying to help, you know, trying to help content creators. Uh, next up, we got Darker Things. Love the channel name. Darker Things uploads one time per week or more. The type of channel is true crime, urban legends, and conspiracy theories. The goal of the channel is to create content that I enjoy and entertain people. The question is, I'm really seeing a dip in watch time and impressions. Not sure why. Comes down to video performance. So if you are publishing content and people are responding at a high rate, then you're going to continue getting impressions and, you know, people out of those impressions, you're going to have a decent amount of people clicking in, coming in and watching all that. Um, but if, you know, people aren't responding to your content at a competitive rate compared to all the different things that YouTube is showing them, then in that particular case, you are going to take that dip. Um, uh, and the content that is, you know, serving those audiences is going to win. So, <clears throat> and I say win, I mean, that might not be the best way to put it, but I mean, it's kind of how it is, right? Because in a competition, somebody wins, somebody loses, right? Um, so because of that, I mean, other people get trophies, you know, whatever, but some people win, some people lose, some people get trophies. But but uh, on YouTube, they don't have trophies. <laughs> they do, they have play buttons, but they don't have, uh, you know, like participation trophies. So, um, you know, it, it comes down for all of us, right? We're all facing that same thing to where, you know, if we make a bad content decision, then those videos don't get very far. If you go look at my channel right now, I've made, you know, some bad content decisions um, over the last couple of videos. And because of that, those videos haven't done great. Um, you know, I, I play, even though my channel's big, um, I play by the same rules as somebody that's just starting today and publishing their first video. And sometimes I nail it, sometimes I don't. And, you know, that's okay. It's part of the, uh, part of the process. DC Unveiled, um, they upload daily content, been on YouTube for less than a year. They do historical storytelling. Uh, the goal of the channel is to present historical short stories in an entertaining way. And the question is, hey, Nick, I recently got some harsh feedback um, for using AI in my content. Could you share why it's frowned upon in the YouTube community? Thanks. 
So right now, as well, first, um, just as a heads up, so uh, YouTube is making it to where, you know, we're going to have to, you know, check boxes to let people know that, you know, AI has been involved, you know, in the video or that it was AI generated content. Um, but there's, there's a few different things. So one is there are services out there to where you can just type in like, hey, this is what I want a video about, and it'll just make the entire video. Um, some of those services, one in particular has wanted to work with me. Um, they specifically said they have an open checkbook, but I refuse to work with them. And the reason for that is because their service isn't actually for creators. Their service is for people that are just trying to pump out you know, content and just kind of fill voids and maybe make some just like, you know, quick temporary money off of it or something like that, maybe if they can get monetized. Um, so because of that, you know, I've refused to work with them because, you know, a creator isn't somebody that just types in some words and then has, you know, AI just make the entire video. So because of that, there is that side of things. Um, so when it comes to, you know, be, being criticized for using like AI in your thumbnails, I don't think it's wrong to use AI in the thumbnails. If you can do good ones, I think it's fine. I think that there is a very fine line that you walk because some of them look extremely corny. Some people are leaning on AI in order to, you know, make thumbnails because it might look good, but to them, it might look good or it might look better than what they normally do. But, you know, but the thumbnails, you know, actually are kind of corny. And I think that in some some cases it works against them but if you're really good at prompting and you can create something that looks you know very realistic or you know that just illustrates the point in a, in, a, in a good way then in that case you know ai thumbnails can be effective so um, i'm not sure why they were giving you harsh feedback on what it is that you're doing as long as you weren't just putting up you know 100 ai generated content using ai in your content by the way is completely different than, uh, than, you know, uploading, you know, full AI generated content. If you're just using AI, like let's say for example, um, I'm not sure if you've heard about Sora or not. Sora is ChatGPT's video side. OpenAI, their video side, OpenAI is who makes uh, ChatGPT. But one of, the, one of the things with Sora is it looks really real. And I believe that when it comes to AI video, that it's going to be, I mean, sometimes we already do it, but, um, but I think that in the very near future, I think that people aren't even going to have to worry about subscribing to uh, some of the stock video sites and things like that. Because as long as you can type out your idea, as long as you can take what's in your brain and you can get really good at describing what's in your brain, I think in that particular case, it's going to, uh, you know, it's going to be great for B-roll because instead of being like, oh man, I need a clip of somebody doing this and having to go and log into the site and then, you know, search for it and then go through a bunch of different clips trying to figure out, you know, what the right one is. If you're really good at describing things, then you can just type it out. Okay, I need a person. They're sitting at a desk. Um, the, the the lighting is this. The camera that's on them is this. Um, it's at this, you know, um, aperture on the camera. Um, it's, uh, you know, got, you know, these types of colors are included in it. The character is, you know, they have long hair. They have no hair. They're wearing glasses. Um, the camera's slowly panning from, you know, left to right, blah, blah. Then in that particular case, you just type in. And as all of that gets, you know, more and more, then one of the things that's going to happen is we're all going to get better at typing those things in. And I think that, you know, being able to just have that site to where while you're editing, it's just there and it's open. And then you're like, okay, I need B-roll of this. And then you just type it in and then let it do that while you're continuing to edit. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to need this too. And then you type that in or just while you're playing your videos, you know what it is that you need to do. And you have part of your workflow to where it's like, okay, let me sit down. Let me make all these B-roll clips that I'm going to, you know, um, use for this edit. And then you sit down, you batch all those clips out and then you pull them in, you know, to your editing software. So yeah, I, I think, uh, I think AI is going to become a core tool for everybody. I mean, I know already, you know, we got, you know, tube spanner in the house, you know, tube spanners using AI, um, tube buddies using AI. Um, you know, you have chat GPT. There's a, there's a new tool that's out called creative fuel. Um, if you're a chat GPT user, you should check out creative fuel too, because what that does is it actually takes your YouTube channel. Um, um, it's out of beta now, but it takes your YouTube channel and it uses that for context for all of the information it gives you. So basically it learns about your audience and you know, all that stuff. And then basically it's like, Hey, based on your channel and what it is that you're doing on YouTube, here's the advice, you know, that we have for you. So it's really cool. Um, in that regard, but it's called creative fuel. If you're already using chat GPT. But all these different tools, though, you know, they're using it. So, you know, it's just it's just going to be part of our workflows, like even when it comes to titles, right? So when you're writing a title, uh, you know, you, you, you know, might write that title and be like, man, this title's great. But I recommend that you use, you know, one of the tools that I mentioned, 
and that you put it in there and you're like, okay, give me different versions of this. And, um, or, you know, write this in a bunch of different ways or make a better title than this. Give me 20 versions of this. And then by doing that, um, it's going to give you a bunch of different versions and you can look for things. You don't have to use the titles, but you can look for words or you can look for different phrasing, or maybe it just makes a title. You're like, oh yeah, it's way better Then in that particular case. You can just kind of sample it out to where it's like, oh, this word, this is good. I'm going to use this. Right. Um, so you can look for those, you know, those, uh, bigger like impact words and, and things like that. How we got here, Genealogy says, should we get Dia participation trophy? Well, not today, but other Saturdays he is here, at least in body. Yeah, since he doesn't have a play button. <laughs> he has a play button in spirit, though. He has a play button in uh, spirit. So I know on a uh, live stream, it might have been uh, might have been a StreamYard stream. I can't remember where it was, but uh, but yeah, he mentioned that he was actually going to, uh, that he was actually going to order one. So uh, so I'm waiting on the, waiting on that to, waiting on that to happen. So uh, let's see here. Next up on our list, by the way, if you are just joining us, what we're doing right now is I'm answering YouTube questions. So if you're a YouTube content creator, um, we're talking about all things related to YouTube. So I have a form down in the description. If you're watching the landscape version, I have a form down in the description where you can put your question in there and um, and we're answering them in the order they received. If you put it down there now, we will get it answered on the stream today. Um, if you are in the vertical version, I'm working out a website URL that I'm just going to be able to say and then you know redirect. I'm also working on some graphics that I'm going to be adding into StreamYard and stuff like that. Um, but for now, just hit my channel name, go over to uh, my YouTube channel. You're going to see the other live stream down in the description of that. Um, you'll be able to find that, that form. So uh, we DC unveiled. I think we've got that. Okay, yeah, we did. Okay, so next up, we've got trying to learn bikes. They make videos for the creative challenge. And the question is, because I primarily make how-to videos about very specific motorcycle engines and parts, most of my videos are typically search-based. That's perfectly fine, by the way. Um, says, when looking through my analytics, very few subscribers or return viewers when I post a new video. Should I be concerned and maybe try to make different kinds of videos, or is that just how it goes with my type of channel? Yeah, what you got to think about is, hey, Stanley Orchard in the house. What's up, dude? Hope you're doing great. Um, so let's say that you publish uh, a, a video today about, uh, you know, how to how to fix a motor on a Yamaha V-Star, right? Or, or like a spark plug on a Yamaha V-Star. Then in that particular case, the only people that are going to care about that particular video are people that, one, have a Yamaha V-Star. So that limits a ton of people. Um, it limits it down to a bunch of people. Two, it has to be people that are not only riding a Yamaha V-Star, but they also have to care enough, or not care enough, but they have to be uh, DIY enough to actually want to do something like that themselves, which is going to shave it down even more. And then from there, then it has to be, you know, somebody that clicks on your video instead of clicking on somebody else's video. But let's say you do find that person and then they come in and they watch that Yamaha video. Then in that particular case, let's say the next video that you publish is on a different motorcycle. Well, in that particular case, that Yamaha person isn't going to care about it because that's not what they have and that information isn't relevant to them. So the problem that you're having is also very common for, uh, for automotive channels too. Um, so what I recommend is that if you are going to want people to keep coming back is if you can, and I don't know if you can or not, but I would basically build out playlists for you know every motorcycle that you work on and in the videos direct people to those playlists right so hey if you have a v star make sure that you click into this playlist because i have all of my you know specific uh tools or my specific videos for yamaha v star in that playlist and then also make sure that you're adding those to your channel page as well now um in addition to that one thing that you can also do if we expand this out a little bit so that's your search-based content that you're already making you already have people coming in from that um so that's something that you're already doing and that's just a way to kind of organize it and do it in a way to where it makes it easy for them to find more of the content that they're coming to you for at least in that session or at least something they can bookmark and come back to um now let's talk about how do you get more people coming back to the channel in general so uh one of the things that you can definitely do is you could talk about cleaning motorcycles um, because, you know, it doesn't matter what type of motorcycle that you have, you're going to need to clean it. So you can talk about all the different, you know, things related to detailing motorcycles. You could talk about um, general motorcycle parts and upgrades. Like, you know, maybe, I don't know, you know, if people are putting lights underneath them or, you know, anything like that, but just any any upgrades that would apply to most motorcycles. Um, you could talk about those. Um, you could talk about, uh, you know, clothing around motorcycles, different jackets and helmets and, you know, things like that. But basically what I'm getting at, if you can't tell, is what you'd want to do is you'd want to say, okay, when it comes to motorcycles, I've got the people that are coming in and they're interacting with my content that is, you know, related to the specific things that they care about, um, you know, to their specific motorcycle, but they're not watching my other stuff. 
So how do I get people to watch my other stuff? Well, what is it that I can make videos about as one of my content pillars? So I'm still serving these different motorcycle, you know, um, uh, brands. But when it comes to, you know, one of the pillars of content that I'm going to do, or maybe a couple, what can I talk about that's general that would relate to everybody that drives a motorcycle? It could be safety stuff, cleaning stuff, accessories, things like that. But um, but if you want to get more returning viewers, then I would definitely start sprinkling that stuff into what it is that you're doing. And then that gives people a reason to come back. And let's say that I just watched your video on cleaning or, or fixing a spark plug in a uh, V-Star. Well, in that particular case, if YouTube then recommends me your recommendations on helmets or you know some other accessory or something like that, as long as you package it right, then in that particular case, that could still pull me back in because it would be something general that then I would still care about, right? So, uh, so because of that, I would definitely just try to consider what can I make that would open me up to just a broader audience of motorcycle enthusiasts to where it doesn't have to be pinned to a very specific brand or a very specific part or maintenance problem, right? Um, that would be the that would be the approach that I would take for that. Uh, let's see here. So next up on our list here, we've got, and we're on number 10, and really quick, LHN Family Gaming says passed 1,000 subs last night. Absolutely love it, love it, love it. High five, this bump. High five, high, high, high five, this bump. High five, high five, this bump. High five, high five. Now everybody's <laughs> Clapping. Hope you guys can hear that. All right. So I hope you could hear that. I'm not sure if you could uh, or not. But hey, congratulations to you for crossing your first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, that's hard. Most channels don't make it that far. So the fact that you've gotten to a thousand subscribers on YouTube, like you're crushing. So just acknowledge that and be like, hey, I'm doing awesome, <laughs> right? But high five this month to you for crossing that. But you say, uh, um, let's see here, past a thousand subs last night. Thanks for all of your help. Would love for you to say hi in our Fortnite stream sometime. Yeah, nice. Nice. Yeah, you can add me on PlayStation. It's, it's just my name if you, uh, if you add me over there. Demons Row in the house. What's up, my dude? Super chat. Super chat says, uh, do you think that uh, YouTube will go after full AI videos? I see multiple channels posting the same video and switching the covers. If YouTube gets greedy, they could uh, rob most. They could create teams for every niche and just not pay humans. Technically, yeah, they could do that. Um, but I think at scale... Um, I think part of the thing that makes, you know, YouTube, YouTube is the people, but, you know, without question, I mean, you know, we don't know where this stuff is going. Um, and it might be possible for, you know, people to make, like, I know there's a, a guy that I saw just the other day. Um, he was showing how he made some AI characters in Heijin, and he basically built YouTube channels or tutorial channels around these AI characters. And like, nobody noticed, right? Everybody thought it was a real person. So uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing, I think that you're definitely you know, like, like there's definitely that, you know, side of things, but the amount of, you know, infrastructure and, you know, people checking it and all that stuff that it would take to actually, you know, ensure that it was something good, I think would be, uh, you know, pretty intense. But, uh, in terms of, do I think that, that they'll go after AI video? They're already going after AI video. So people that do have like, you know, AI content farms and stuff like that, like they're already going after them and they're making things a little bit more, um, not difficult, but they're just like, you know, Hey, you know, like, you know, we need some real content here, not just flooding the platform with garbage, right? Because most of that stuff right now is flooding the platform with garbage. Um, but if it adds value to people and people can't notice, then in that particular case, you know, there's not really, you know, anything that uh, they could do in that situation as long as it was disclosed that it was created uh, with AI. But yeah, I, th I think this is, I think, uh, you know, our near future, uh, you know, just all kinds of cans of worms, you know, coming out of it. But, uh, you know, one, one way to look at it would be, you know, what, what can I do or how can I use some of these tools to make things easier for myself, right? Because, you know, if other people are going to be using them and it's going to help them get the leg up on what it is that they're doing, then what can I use and what can I do in order to also be able to, you know, to, to, to use this stuff to my advantage, right? Yeah, content farms get a block from me too. Uh, a apocalyptic uh, retrospective. <laughs> so Midwest Ghost Hunters is our uh, next channel here. They do bi-weekly content, been on YouTube for a year or more. Um, it's an entertainment channel. The goal is to take viewers on a journey behind the headlines of all unsolved murders and paranormal phenomena. 
Um, the question is, hey, Nick, uh, we just came monetized this week. High five, fist bump. Love these like milestones coming in. It's great. Um, that has never been a real goal of the channel, but now that we're there, what's one piece of advice that you have for newly monetized channel? Thanks for all you do for small creators. So um, when it comes to a monetized channel, one thing that I do recommend that you do, and, and like you say right here, you're like, this wasn't really our goal, you know, to get monetized, you know, on YouTube. But now that you are, if you do want to make the most out of, you know, the, the ads that you're getting on your videos, then in that particular case, make sure that you do pay attention to the uh, videos that do drive higher ad revenue. Make sure that you're looking at the CPMs and RPMs for the different types of content that you put out. So let's say, for example, if you notice, hey, uh, you know, when we talk about these things, we always get like a much higher, uh, you know, CPM or RPM compared to when we talk about these things. Then in that case, if you were wanting to do it for increasing the revenue, then you would just need to make sure that you're working some of those higher CPM videos into your content strategy over 30 30 or 90 days, you know, whatever it is that you do with your, when you're putting your content strategy together. But, uh, but you would basically work those, you'd work those things in. Um, and then by doing that, you would ensure that you're making those videos that typically have higher ad rates. Some people will just go all in on those. They'll be like, hey, if I'm doing this for ad revenue, then in that case, I'm going all in on that. Um, but another thing that I would also, uh, you know, uh, like to uh, remind you of is, you know, you can also not do any of that. And you can just focus on making great content for your viewers because it's easy to get caught up on, you know, the, the ad side. Um, but you can also just be like, hey, you know, what do we think would be the best fit for the viewers? And if you do that, then the money's going to come anyway. So you don't really have to worry about it that much. Um, but one thing that you can do um, is the videos that you do find that drive a higher CPM. And this is just a minor thing. This isn't something to spend a lot of time on. Um, but you can figure all this out really quick by just going into your advanced analytics and sorting, um, you know, in there. But uh, one thing that you can do is you can actually take higher CPM videos and you can put them on a playlist on your channel page um, as one of the sections that you add there. And then that way, you you know, you're at least, you know, kind of trying to bring a little bit more attention to them. Um, another thing that you can do is you can, as long as they're in alignment with the interests of the people watching a specific video, in that specific video, you can also hand off or tell people on the end screen to go click on and watch um, one of the other videos that they would enjoy. But you can do that around the videos that drive the higher CPMs too. Um, but the whole idea is just informing yourself on what performs the best in that regard on the monetization side. And then once you do discover that, and you can be like, okay, how can I bring more attention to these videos? Or how can I bring more attention to these topics? Or, you know, whatever the thing is there. Oh, let's see here. This DJ 808, what's going on? Love the 808 part. All about that bass. All right. So next up, we've got uh, Spectrum Art Studio. Spectrum Art Studio does art tutorials and reviews. The goal of the channel is to help people improve their art skills. The question is, I've been trying to add captions in a few different languages um, that I know have an interest in my channel. I followed YouTube tutorials that are made um, in the past few months, but I don't have the facility to duplicate and edit, and I don't have the facility to add. Uh, my automatic captions are ineligible, and this is for clips where I have and haven't created my own closed captions. Happy for your expertise or that of others. I spent around three hours on YouTube and Google. Okay, so if you're trying to add captions in different languages, all you have to do is one, um, make sure that you do have captions in the original language. Um, so YouTube has their own captions that they add to it, but also manually add or have like rev.com or whoever else add captions um, to your videos. Once you have those captions in there, if you go into the language section of your YouTube channel or to the individual video, sorry, go into whatever video that you're trying to add those translations to. And in the same section, you can add captions and you can also trans you can translate the captions and you can also translate your title and your description so when it comes to translating your title and description this is just a, a secret to buddy part that most people don't even know that they have but when it comes to the translations if you're a TubeBuddy user, um, it will automatically translate your titles and descriptions as well. So all you have to do is just open up that box. And when you're translating it, um, you just click on translate on TubeBuddy and it will automatically translate it to whatever language it is that you're choosing. Um, and if you don't use that, then you have to copy and paste everything into Google and translate uh, into Google Translate. So it's basically doing all of that for you um, automatically. So if you are a TubeBuddy user, that just makes that side of things, you know, a lot easier. Um, but all you have to do is just go into that particular area and then you'll do it there but you have to make sure that you have 
captions in order to uh, be able to add all the different translations for the captions. But all you have to do from there is when you click on add a language, um, when you click that add language option, it's going to give you a list and then you just choose whatever language it is. It's going to put it in that uh, you know area. And then you click on the pencil icon. When you click on that pencil icon, um, you're going to see a little option that says auto translate. And again, this only shows up if you have the captions added in the native language. Um, but you basically click on the auto translate option option there and it'll automatically caption your uh your your subtitles and then as soon as you save that then you go and do the metadata as well then that way the people that you're trying to reach they're going to see it in the written form in terms of your title and description and they're going to see it in the subtitles when you get access to it oops super chat really quick uh i just want to thank uh, i think it was called one second here dome house thank you for the uh super sticker there super appreciate it two buddy says translations for the win absolutely <laughs> so uh uh when you are uh you know doing that you can also um, if you have the feature enabled right now, it's only 50,000 channels that have this, but you can also do the, uh, audio translations as well. So right now I have a thumbnail video that's up, um, that that now has the audio translations in it. Um, I have just submitted, um, using ditto dubbing, um, ditto dubbing.com. Um, I just submitted, uh, a video that's publishing tomorrow. So, um, I'm going to have the, the audio translations for that one at the time of publish. And then um, I'm also trying it on a video that did well about things that can get your YouTube channel deleted. Um, so basically, I'm just going to keep running through that process. I spent like 1500 bucks on Ditto Dub. And then um, from there, you know, I've got all of those credits. So I'm just going to burn those credits out, see if it makes, you know, see if it makes a difference. So uh, let's see here. So next up, we've got Learn Spanish World. Learn Spanish World does educational content. The goal of the channel is to provide my community with value by means of offering a wide range of Spanish learning related videos. And the question is, what's better uh, for merch, Spreadshop or Teespring? I find Teespring a bit messy. Me too. Um, I can't re-upload products. And when I try, it doesn't work. I think you answered the question yourself. <laughs> yeah, def definitely. You know, I use Spreadshop. Um, it, it's easy. All the stuff's in there when they, you know, deliver everything. The quality's good. I did have uh, one batch that I got a long time ago where, like, the the pattern was off a little bit to where, like, it's supposed to be center, but it was, like, a little bit off. So I just sent an email, and I'm like, hey, I mean, they, they've sponsored me, you know, in the past. But I was like, you know, hey, uh, uh, you know, this is, like, off or whatever. And they're like, hey, no problem. You know, we'll, we'll send you out a new one, you know, whatever. The Dream Builder. Does automotive content, the goal of the channel is to entertain people with my entertain people with my projects and distract them from their day. And the question is, what external hard drive docking station do you recommend? Um, I don't have any recommendations for external docking stations. I use just stacks of uh, external hard drives. It's probably not the best way to do it, but I use I just use stacks of external hard drives. And for anything important, then I just back those hard drives up with other external hard drives. So in this cabinet right here, I just have a big stack of external hard drives. Some of them are like full hard drives that you stick into a dock. Um, some of them are like that. And then some of them are just like the, you know, Western Digital or the SanDisk, you know, since since the technology for memory is getting smaller and smaller. Like I've got like a, I think it's like a four terabyte uh, SD or uh, SanDisk uh, thing plugged into the Mac Studio back there. Um, so, you know, I, I use that kind of stuff. Uh, see here, next up, we've got Robo, uh, Rob, sorry, Rob the Builder. Rob the Builder, uh, they upload one time per week or more. The type of channel is tool testing and being self-sufficient. Cool channel. Um, the goal is to be monetized. And the question is, if I do not get 500 subscribers in a year for the YouTube Partner Program, will I need to start a new channel and start over? No, you will not. So when it comes to the YouTube Partner Program, you need to meet the qualifications within a 365-day period, like from when you hit them. So uh, basically, you have your watch time. So that watch time, it drops off um, after a year. So let's say that you, know, you get 3,000 hours of watch time, and it's been a year. Well, what's going to happen is now you're going to start having watch time bleed out every day. So every day you're going to have some of your watch time goes away. 
And uh, and as you're as that's happening, you're replacing it with new watch time as people are interacting with new content. When it comes to the subscribers, no worries in that particular case because um, you know if you gain a thousand subscribers, it's likely that you're going to you know maintain those one thousand subscribers because some will drop off, some you know will will still subscribe. So that one's pretty easy. But the big complaint that new content creators have that are trying to get monetized is where's my watch time going? Because what will happen is uh, there's a few different things. One they'll accidentally unlist or private videos. And when you do that and the videos are no longer public, then what's going to happen is you actually lose the public watch time. So that goes against your monetization. Um, in addition to that, um, at that 360 to five day period, then on that 366th day, uh, you know, when you're publishing that, you know, next video or whatever, that watch time you got 365 days ago is now gone. So because of that, it becomes like this race almost. But here's the thing. Once you get your content to a competitive level, you will always hit that 4,000 hours of watch time as long as you continue publishing videos. Once your skill sets and you know how, you know, get to that point, and once you learn how to make videos that, you know, people respond to in the best way, um, then in that, or at least just at a competitive rate, then in that particular case, then, um, then you know, you'll just, it'll be easy to hit those, uh, to hit those milestones. Um, let's see here. So really quick, we got another super chat from uh, Blood on the Razor Wire. Thank super you for the super chat. chat. This one came in on the vertical side. It says, true crime and prison content, YouTube picks and chooses who they will push. I really feel that way. Two 200,000 subs, views, not there. Um, okay, so here's the thing. YouTube doesn't. So how it works is YouTube actually um, is a response-based system. So a lot of content creators, and you'll see this everywhere, um, where content creators are like, you know, hey, YouTube isn't showing my content to people, you know, things like that. But in reality, how it works is YouTube is showing your content to people. If you go look at your impressions, you'll see that YouTube is giving your videos impressions. So from there, it's going to come down to, you know, how good are you at getting people to click on those videos and then come in and give them uh, an experience with your content that is competitive with the other things that you know that you the that the people that youtube is showing your content to are also watching right so um so it's really easy um for all of us right like i've put out some videos you know recently that haven't done that great um and with those particular videos it would be easy for me to be like you know what youtube just isn't showing these to people but if i go and i look in the impressions youtube showed them to people but if i go in and i look at you know the click-through rate it's not horrible but it's not great but if i look at the retention you guys just weren't interested in those videos. So because of that, the response is, well, if people aren't interested in the videos, then let's show people videos that they are interested in and not show people the videos that people are not interested in or they're, that they're not having as much of a satisfactory experience. We all live and die by that in terms of our videos, um, regardless of the type of content that we make. It doesn't matter if it's true crime or if it's educational or if it's motivational or if you're showing people how to craft or if you're showing, you know, sharing your just opinions on stuff, whatever. Um, we all play by that same, you know, by that same, uh, by the same rule. 86th, also on the vertical super side. Chat. Thanks for the super chat. Says, um, FYI, the vertical stream showed up in my feed first. Ooh, interesting. Very interesting. Evil, ga new, uh, evil Gaming. Welcome to the Nimenati. Welcome to the Nimenati. Make sure when you get the chance, you go to nimenvip.com. That is That will redirect you to our members-only Facebook group. Um, fill out all the information there. If that's something that you're interested in, we also have a Discord as well. So if you are in Discord, now that you're a channel member, if you go into our community Discord, which should be linked in the description of the long form uh, or the landscape version, um, then in that particular case, uh, you can uh, go into Discord and you'll automatically have access to uh, to that. And make sure I got everybody taken care of here. And blood uh, on the razor wire. Super Thank you for the other super sticker as well. Super appreciated there. Yeah, you know, like the, the hard thing for for us as content creators is, you know, just being like, you know, like owning it, right? The, there's there's a book uh, that I recommend to everybody. Like if you're a content creator, it's called Extreme Ownership. And it's kind of over the top, um, you know, in terms of the the person that wrote it, you know, or the people that wrote it, um, they're they're like in the military and stuff. And they're they're basically taking responsibility for all the horrible things that, you know, that have happened on their watch and stuff like that. And the whole premise of the book, because um, they do like corporate training now and stuff like that, but but the whole premise of the book is basically knowing and and just kind of being like you know what um you know there's there are always external factors you know at play 
However, you know, like, am I doing, you know, the best that I can do? It did, could I have avoided that if I would have put in a little bit more planning? Could I have made, in our, in our case, could I have made that better video if I would have spent more time? Or could I have gotten a better response on that video if I would have, you know, looked into the topic a little bit more? Um, if I would have, you know, worked on that hook just a little bit longer, right? Um, if I would have, you know, maybe asked some people for some feedback on this video before I published, you know, those types of things. So, you know, so it, it you know, it all comes down to us. Chatty Kathy says vertical feed was first in your notifications too. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So the vertical, the vertical version, I'll end up unlisting um, that one, but I love it for, uh, for, you know, like while I'm actually live, because then it's like, Hey, if you want to watch it over there, you can, if you want to watch it here um, for the landscape version, you can love it. All right. So next up on our list here, did I do this one? We've got 500 subscribers for the year. Okay. Got that covered. Amy Johnson, what's going on? Hope that you're doing great. Says the vertical is at the top of my homepage. Okay, it seems to be kind of like a vibe that's happening here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Dr. Vibe Show, what are the odds of that? Dr. Vibe Show uh, does, uh, the type of channel is, to, is a show to empower, educate, and entertain black people. The goal of the channel is to educate and empower people and also to monetize. And the question is, I host, I host a live interview show. I use StreamYard to broadcast live horizontally. Do you think it's a good idea to broadcast at the same time uh, via YouTube live vertical, even if the camera is only myself during the vertical broadcast? FYI, thanks for your rec recommendation about Opus Clip. It has been very helpful with boosting my channel views. Awesome. Love that, you, uh, that you've that you had that experience with Opus Clip. Love that you're using StreamYard and that you're trying to figure out the best way to do it. So to answer your question, right now, I am live vertically using StreamYard and I'm live here using StreamYard. So I'm doing it uh, a little bit different possibly than what you might do. For example, my vertical is all being ran on my laptop using a camera that is still landscape mode, but I'm running it into a cam link and then that cam link is, you know, allowing the signal to come through. An awesome thing about the new roadcaster, excuse me, an awesome thing about the new roadcaster is that it has two outputs. So I can connect this roadcaster. Excuse me. So I can connect that roadcaster to my MacBook for the vertical, and I can connect it to my PC for the landscape version. And then that allows the same audio signal to go out to everything. And this right here, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, this right here is the roadcaster that I'm talking about for those of you on the landscape version. So this right here, it has two outputs. And then, then those outputs, it's just two USBs or USB-Cs. And I can just have one going into each, in, into each machine. It's pretty awesome. All right. Really quick, Dome House. Super chat. Thanks for Super Chat. Says a month old channel. I'm a cinematographer for TV commercials. <laughs> Man, my throat's drying out. Uh, cinematographer for uh, TV commercials and a Pilates instructor. Combined skills, mainly females who do this type of workout, but our viewers are 85% men. Any idea why? Yeah, pr probably if you are doing Pilates, you might have either guys that are really into Pilates um, or they're coming in there for other reasons. Um, that would be, oh, your fiance is a Pilates instructor. Yeah. So uh, with that, so one thing that um, that I see on a regular basis is, you know, those types of channels, um, not just Pilates, but like fitness and yoga and things like that. Um, uh, they do attract, you know, people that are into that. But a percentage of the audience can also be people that are there watching it for reasons other than what the content creator intends. So because of that, it's just kind of a side effect for being out there, you know, in the public eye, some things that you can do. Um, I'll let you know. So some things that you can do, um, is you could try to just target women more. So like in the, in the titles, for example, I mean, even though they're still going to click on it, like if you have a thumbnail and, you know, somebody, you know, sees that thumbnail that is going to watch it for the other reasons besides learning the routine, then in that particular case, if somebody sees that thumbnail, 
then you know they're still going to click on it regardless of what the title says. Um, but if you did start optimizing things for women, so for example, um, let's say that you <laughs> thanks Tiffany, <laughs> but let's say that you um, let's say that you are um, publishing a video and it's like you know three you know workout or three uh, you know Pilates moves you know whatever, um, but putting in there like four women. Um, you know, something like that into the title, it can at least ensure that you're getting more, you know, women clicking on it. But again, if the thumbnail is something that a, a guy might find enticing, then in that particular case, like they're probably going to come in and watch it anyway. So it, unfortunately, it's just one of those things where like, if you're putting yourself out there, um, you know, um, even though you're, you know, trying to help people stay in shape and, you know, things like that, um, then, you know, people are going to do that. Um, so, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna sound, you know, crazy, but if you're trying to avoid all of that completely, then, you know, just being in like sweatpants and, you know, like a t-shirt and things like that. But in my opinion, you shouldn't have to do that because I know people that do, uh, you know, Pilates and yoga and all that, they wear, you know, specific clothing for specific reasons so that it's not getting all caught up, you know, when they're doing their moves and all that. So, you know, because of that, you know, you're just kind of in one of those situations where you kind of have to, you know, deal with it, um, unfortunately. But, you know, some, you know, like Ch Chantel here says that, you know, some, you know, guys um, are into Pilates too. Absolutely. But some, you know, also just like watching, you know, people do that also. So, unfortunate. Um, let's see here. So the vertical streaming option, Fitness Boss, um, I have a video coming out about this um, tomorrow. So make sure that you do, you know, have notifications turned on for my channel. But I show you how to go live vertically into the shorts feed. It's the vertical feed, but it shows up when people are watching shorts, um, just like it does on like TikTok, for example. So when uh, in that particular video, I show you how to do it on a phone quickly. I show you how to do it on a computer quickly. And I show you how to do it with StreamYard as well. Um, with StreamYard, the reason I show that one is one, they're sponsored the channel, but two, because I'm using it right now um, to stream vertically um, so that I can still get like high quality, you know, uh, video and audio and everything through there. I'm working on graphics that I'll be adding to it to let people know like, hey, if you have your question, go to this URL, things like that. Um, so it's a different experience over there, but StreamYard does make that experience easier um, because we are, you know, because we do have the ability to add graphics and things like that. Um, let's see here. So next up on our list, we've got, okay, we did Dr. Vibe. <clears throat> if you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. Next up, we've got Transcend Furniture Gallery. Transcend Furniture, Furniture Galaxy has been on YouTube for a year or more. They do DIY furniture refinishing. The goal of the channel is to share what I do every day and make a living doing it. The question is, I've been making videos for about three years, and I had a big rise early on. My first year and a half, my second year, were the best financially. I'm closing out on the end of my third year, and I'm posting three times per month, with the exception of an occasional month where I can only get out two. I have over 250,000 subscribers. Most views are between 40 and 150,000 per video within the first month, with some doing much better. I guess my question is hard to formulate, but something I've noticed is that um, if I miss even two weeks uploading, my views drop dramatically and thus my income. Currently, I've been there, uh, see, it's been three weeks since I posted because of travel, et cetera, and my income per day is just sad. I'm wondering if there's something that I can do to keep views and RPM up during those periods of a week um, or a few weeks where I can post to help keep my AdSense revenue more consistent. So um, in your particular case, you're doing DIY and furniture refinishing content. So because of that, I would definitely make sure that like, and, and here's the thing, like if you do 40 to, to 150,000 views per month, um, or sorry, uh, within the first month on your videos, then I'm guessing that that isn't coming from search, that you're getting recommendation traffic so people are responding to your content there. But one thing that I would do when you are making your content because you're clearly good at getting people to respond, you know, from the recommendation features, is I would also try to work in, you know, keywords, keyword phrases into your uh, titles so that you can also try to leverage search traffic if you're if you're not already. And you don't have to do this with every video, but the thing with YouTube search is it is extremely stable traffic. So if you can get good rankings in YouTube search, then it can kind of stabilize everything so that your baselines don't drop below like a certain level. Keep in mind, if you're not publishing on a regular basis, then your recommendations do go down in YouTube. I've actually got a graphic in here um, that shows, give me one second and I'll, I'll show it to you. I think I showed it during a TubeBuddy stream. 
Yeah, so one of the things it says right here, and I'm showing a graphic over on the uh, on the on the other stream, um, but it says uh, if I take a break from uploading, will this hurt my channel performance? And this is in the Google Help section, um, the YouTube side of the Google Help section. It says we encourage you to take breaks when you need them. We studied thousands of channels that took a break and found no correlation between break length and changes in views. Keep in mind, it may take some time to warm up your audience again as they get back to their regular viewing uh, routines. Um, that wasn't actually what I was wanting to show you. Give me one second. Here it is. Uh, my channel's getting less traffic from Homer Suggested. It says, there are many reasons for a channel's viewership to increase or decline over time. Here are some of the most common reasons for drops in traffic from recommendations. Your audience is watching more of other videos and channels on YouTube. So all this applies also to the people that are like, hey, my impressions have dropped out or whatever. This applies to, to you also. Um, but they're watching you know, other videos and channels on YouTube. The audience is spending less time on YouTube. Um, you've had a few high-performing videos or a video went viral, but those viewers didn't return to watch more uploading less frequently than usual, right? This might be something that you're dealing with. Um, and then the topic of your videos are focused on is declining in popularity. So when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, you know, your publishing schedule, try to, you know, publish, you know, on a, on a consistent basis, right? Cause that's definitely important, but um, you can also work around some of that by making some content that's search targeted. But keep in mind with search targeted content, it's likely unless you're double dipping, like, okay, I'm optimizing this for recommendations, but I'm also squeezing in, you know, keywords and keyword phrases so that I can show up in YouTube search. And I'm doing keyword research beforehand before I commit to making a video so that I can make sure that I can actually compete for this term. If you start taking those types of actions, then you'll be able to create a stable baseline of traffic. However, when it comes to the recommendation system, then in that particular case, uh, you know, if you are publishing less, then you do have less videos going out, then you have less new tags, you have less videos to, to feed new people that are coming into the channel. So one thing that is awesome about publishing on a regular basis, and don't get me wrong, you can make one good video and you can make one good video a month and it might bring in all of that traffic to where there's enough people to where YouTube's like, hey, um, let's start showing the archive of this channel and then it starts showing your videos from your archive. And then as long as people start responding to your to that content as well, then it just keeps everything rolling, right? So it's not a big deal. But if you find that everything is, is you know, like, hey, I'm just publishing kind of sort of no real consistency or anything like that, um, then you can see, you know, um, drops in drops in traffic. Um, and that comes from just not putting out that new content to bring new people in is like old people are falling off things like that. Um, and there's nothing really, if you don't have content that's just constantly performing in the recommendation system, then you don't have, you know, anything that's actually feeding, you know, the channel if the other videos don't continually do well over a long period of time. So because of that, that's where I would mix in some search related things so that you can, you know, have that, those things where people are looking for them at a high rate and then they're finding your videos, clicking on your videos, and then, you know, coming to you for the solution for those. Um, that would definitely be something I would consider. Yeah, another thing too is like, you know, as more, you know, furniture channels, you know, hit the hit the scene, um, you know, if they start making, you know, better content or content that's as competitive, then, you know, they're going to have the option between watching them or watching you. Sometimes they're going to pick you. Sometimes they're going to pick those channels. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a constant thing in that regard in terms of just making sure that you're sharp, making sure that the content that you're putting out is landing with the people that you're trying to reach, and then making sure that your strategy does give you uh, the opportunity to where it's like, hey, I'm making, you know, recommendation-focused content. Content, but then I'm also, um, you know, optimizing it so that um, that it would also, you know, show up in uh, in search. And keep in mind, YouTube system is smart enough to take videos that are not keyword optimized and still put them in YouTube search for certain results too. And as long as people respond to them there, then you can still get traffic. But you can help the system by optimizing for it. Because one of the things that YouTube, um, you know, shares with us, if you go to the Google help pages, they'll, they'll tell you this. But um, if you look in YouTube search, the default filter is relevance. So, you know, in order to change that, you have to actually go in and physically change it. But most people, they just go in and they type in what it is they're looking for. And then they look at the recommendations that are there. So because of that, when you optimize for relevance, it increases your chances of showing up there, um, at least, you know, quicker, because you've helped the system have more context in what it is that you're actually doing. So that's why, you know, having those words or phrases in the, uh, in your titles and descriptions, as long as people are responding well to the content when it, you know, when it shows up in those results, um, that's where it can, you know, definitely lead to just some good, you know, long-term steady traffic. Yeah, I actually have a notification in my channel. Um, it said something along the lines of that I had enough content in the channel to where I could upload less and rely on my archive. But, uh, but that's just not true. Like, uh, you know, like my archive, it's just not strong enough 
um, you know, because there's a lot of people that make content like me now. So my archive is just not strong enough to uh, to 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 maintain, you know, high numbers consistently without me publishing on a somewhat regular basis. Next up, we got movie reviews. Um, they upload every other day. The type of channel is movie reviews. The goal of the channel is full-time income. The question is, hey, Nick, um, I hope that you're having a great day. What's up? I am having a great day. I hope that you are as well. Um, it says, my channel is based around movies, TV series, reviews, news, et cetera. Since my content is search-based, what would be the best ideas for discovery and getting in front of more people? Your podcast is fantastic to listen to while gardening. Awesome. Glad that you're enjoying it. So um, when it comes, if you have a search-based channel, um, the best ideas for discovery, obviously, if you are doing YouTube search, you know, if you're if you're targeting YouTube search right now, and that's all you're doing, then in that particular case, I would start trying your hand at the recommendation system. So the, the question that we answered just a second ago, I would do the opposite of that. So what you're doing right now is you're just serving, you know, YouTube search, and that's what you're targeting with everything. Um, when you do that, as long as your videos are performing well, and they're, you know, of a somewhat, you know, broad topic within your niche and stuff like that, you'll still get recommendation traffic. But if you are, uh, you know, intentionally designing your content for the purpose of the recommendation system, then in that particular case, then you can get, you know, bigger rewards out of the recommendation system as long as people respond well to your content. That as long as people respond well to your content part, we'll just tack that onto the back of everything that we say, right? But the way that you do that, and I demonstrate this a lot, but like, um, let's say in this particular case right here, let's say, let's say we use this mouse as an example. The way that you would do that in terms of the targeting the different uh, traffic sources is if you are targeting um, YouTube homepages and or just recommendation systems in general, then in that particular case, you know, this mouse changed the way that I work would be the topic of a video. And with that video, because all this starts at the topic, you know, that's important to know. But basically, you know, maybe the thumbnail would be, you know, this, and then maybe, you know, you're like pointing to it or, you know, you're, you know, some type of expression of some kind or whatever. And it's like this mouse changed the way that, you know, that I work or this mouse made me X percent more uh, productive, right? Something like that. So then in that particular case, it's opened up to anybody that has a computer and that wants to be productive. That's the qualifier for that particular video. Now, on the opposite of that, when it comes to YouTube search, it's different because when it comes to YouTube search, just putting, you know, this mouse changed the way that I do things, it's not enough because in that particular case, when people are looking for it, they're not looking for a, a mouse that will change your productivity, right? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't imagine tons of people are looking for that. Um, but if people are like, hey, and again, it starts at the idea, right at the topic of the video. But if they're like, uh, you know, hey, I've seen people talking about this Logitech um, MX Master. So uh, let me search for it and see the videos that pop up. Then in that particular case, the video topic would be like a review of this or a setup of this or a how you use this, right? Um, that would be the topic of the video. And in that particular case, it's better suited for YouTube search because it's based around topically the things that people would search for in order to find this. But on the recommendation side, when you're like, this mouse changed the way that, you know, changed the way that I work or maybe X percent more productive or whatever. In that particular case, it's different because there... They don't have to know what the type of mouse is. They don't have to know anything about this. They don't even have to know what Logitech is. They don't have to know anything. All they have to know is that um, what a mouse is, and they have to use a mouse, and they would have to care about being more productive, right? So, uh, so it's just a totally different thing when you're trying to get attention from the recommendation system compared to uh, compared to search. Hope that made sense. Um, let's see here. So, next up, <laughs> the whatever man says. Uh, now I just want that mouse. Hey, it's on the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, let's see here. So next up, uh, we've got Imperial Remnant. Imperial Remnant, um, they do Star Wars information content. That's cool. The goal of the channel is to spread my love for Star Wars and ideally find a second source of income. The question is, I'm still struggling with intrigue on thumbnails, no access to the A-B test yet. So you can use TubeBuddy's A-B test tool. So uh, they have one um, that you can use. So uh, with YouTube's, it's ABC. So you can AB if you want, but you get the option to upload three different thumbnails, um, but everybody doesn't have it yet. Um, it's supposed to roll out over the over the year. So by this by this time next year, by the end of the year, um, I think everybody's supposed to have it. But um, right now, they don't. So because of that, the options that you have are to do it manually yourself, which is time consuming. You have to be on top of it. You know, you got to go in there and be swapping thumbnails out, things like that. Um, or use TubeBuddy. 
And then with TubeBuddy, you basically upload, you know, your original thumbnail, which you actually, it'll just pull it from the video. And then you upload a second thumbnail for it to test. And then it's going to swap them out every day. And then it's going to give you a full report and let you know which traffic sources or which pages of YouTube. It's going to let you know how people responded on each one of those pages. And just a heads up, if you're a TubeBuddy user, they actually um, have updated the flow for their A-B testing tool as well. So that might be something that you want to check out too if you've used it in the past. Okay, let's see here. Next up on the list, we've got... Jerry says that mouse is really life-changing. Yeah, it is. It's pretty awesome. With the... Uh... Huh, did I change my colors to pink in here? Oh, I was in the... Uh... Okay, got it. I was in the wrong area. There we go. Um. Okay, so next up on our list here... Traveling with Russell says, but what is the word to describe two mouses? Be mice, right? I guess unless you use it in that way, because it'd be two mouses or would it be two mice? Yeah, because this is a computer thing. It's not an actual mouse. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know what you would do because it's not an actual mouse. So you couldn't say it's a, you know, if, if there were two of them, you couldn't say it was mice, right? Yeah, because then that would make it not, you know, not accurate. Yeah, I, I don't know what you would call two of these. Two mouses, I guess. <laughs> Uh, getting to serious questions. <laughs> the Last Gate Jumper is our uh, next channel here. They are a reviewer of anime, fantasy shows, and old cartoons. The goal of the channel is to make this their career. And the question is, do you have any recommendations on where I can learn to write good scripts? Um, yeah, good recommendations. So I know, and I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but there's a content creator that um, he actually has a whole YouTube channel about writing scripts. So one thing that I would do to find him, because unfortunately I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but he writes scripts for, you know, all kinds of people, um, like big content creators that, you know, that you might be familiar with already. Um, but on his, for, in order to find him, I would just start, I would hop into YouTube search and start looking for things around, you know, writing scripts, how to write scripts, or, you know, the, the person that, you know, YouTubers hire for scripts and just start looking for those types of things in YouTube search. And one of those should bring you to him in one way or another either through a collaboration that he did or through, you know, his direct, uh, his direct content. Um, Arthur, Arthur Gonzalez, um, it's happening in real time. So every time a video is published to YouTube, which over 500 hours of content is published to the platform um, every minute, so because of that, it's, it's constantly um, changing. It's constantly evolving. And the good content, um, it gets shown to more people. The content that people don't respond to at a competitive rate, it doesn't get shown to as many people because they prioritize the content that performs well. And to define what performs well, it basically creates a satisfactory experience for the viewers. It's something they click on at a competitive rate, and then they watch it for a competitive amount of time, further engage with it you know, at a competitive rate, they share it at a, com at a competitive rate, things like that. Um, if it's a short, similar rules minus the click. So uh, let's see here. So Matt Miller's PCs is the next channel. The goal of the channel says I want to create more flexibility with my family and at the very least allow my wife to stay at home with my kid. Awesome goal. Question is, in my most recent video, it's been almost four days and I've only gotten a thousand impressions. It's never been this low. Normally I get 20 to 30 impressions. My CTR and average view duration are above average. I don't really understand why it's not being pushed. Do you have any thoughts? So make sure that you are comparing it to um to the same impressions so when you're looking at your metrics and you're like hey you know this has higher metrics on it um but it has a lot less impressions um tw you know 20 or 30 times less impressions then in that case it's easier for the for all the metrics around it to be inflated and actually look like it's doing better than it is um because you're used to seeing it at 20 to thirty thousand impressions so make sure that you do go and compare it at uh um, at the same impression amount and in addition to that make sure that you are looking for the videos that do well see where the impressions are coming from and then go and look and see how people are actually responding to the impressions that they're that they're getting in the different traffic sources so one thing that can happen is when you're looking at everything in in generally then in that like let's say you're looking at the quick view you know like analytics and then in that particular case everything is kind of grouped together in terms of how people are responding to everything. So if you go into your advanced mode of analytics, you can go into your traffic sources report. In your traffic sources report, you can see like, hey, is people coming in from my channel page inflating my general response, um, you know, in the general view? Um, or uh, like if I'm, you know, like 
what is the response that I'm getting on home pages? What's the response that I'm getting in suggested videos? What's the response that I'm getting, you know, in search and start looking to see the very specifics of what's going on there. And that might paint a picture. Um, in addition to that, YouTube also has a compare option. So you can, um, in the same advanced analytics, you can click on compare. Once you have the video that is not performing, compare it against one of the ones that are, you can also go to the traffic sources for each one. If you change it to a multi-metric table, and then that will start to, you know, paint a picture of why one is doing better than, uh, than the other. Also consider, and this is always an elephant in the room, also consider that the uh, when it comes to you know your videos and how they perform, the topic of the video itself, right? Like maybe some of your other videos, they just are more broad in general or people just have a lot more interest in the topic to where maybe some of the newer videos um, or at least that new video, maybe just the general topic itself isn't as hot you know, for the people that you're trying to reach or something like that. There's also just the competition. You know, right now, competition could be really high with what it is that you're doing for the people that you're trying to reach. Um, there could be just some, you know, really good content that's being put out right now or that YouTube is showing to, you know, that same audience. Internet anarchist in the house. What's going on, dude? Hope that you're doing fantastic. He says his best videos have the lowest C CTR since they spread to the widest audience. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's super common. Like it's it's hard. Like, uh, you know, as you're as you're as you get more views and impressions on your videos, um, typically what happens, not always, but typically what happens is, you know, the more people that interact with what it is that you're doing, the harder it is to maintain high numbers. So basically the more impressions you get, the more views you get, all that stuff, um, the, the, the numbers start decreasing and you start being like, huh, this doesn't even make any sense because, you know, these are getting a lot of views on them and things like that, but you're actually looking at it in the other direction, right? In, in that particular case. So, uh, so yeah. Thanks for that uh, feedback, Internet Anarchist. So, uh, let's see here. so next up on the list here, we've got uh, Nightingale Japan and Barbers of Japan is the two channels. Um, the type of channel is um, information and entertainment. The goal of the channel is to provide people with insight about Japan. Uh, question is, what was your penny drop moment when things began to click for you? Um. <clears throat> So I had a opportunity to work with somebody who knew what they were doing on YouTube. So uh, basically, you know, when I was, you know, starting out on YouTube, <clears throat> um, I had the opportunity to work with somebody on a completely different channel. And uh, with that, we'd hop on calls and, you know, things like that. And they would just give me advice on things to do. But as part of that process, they had me read a book called Primal Branding. Um, and that particular book right there kind of helped me better understand it, 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 it really relates a lot to, to YouTube and how people respond to YouTube content. Um, but he was also really adamant about the importance of audience and understanding your audience and the people that are going to be interacting with your content and all that stuff. And, um, those things by themselves made a big difference for me because I never really thought of it at that time. I mean, keep in mind, this is almost a decade ago, but at that time I didn't really think of it like, okay, yeah, my channel can be like an entire resource of a certain type of content for certain types of viewers. Um, me, I was just like, Hey, let me publish this. Hey, what's an idea that I have for a video. Okay. Let me publish that. Let me publish that. And I was kind of scattered all over the place. Like a lot of you probably are right now. And when I got that information, I'm like, Oh my God, that makes total sense. I, I'm, I need to build a resource for a certain type of viewer. Then it, everything, you know, just became a lot more clear. And it also, you know, helped me answer difficult questions, you know, like, uh, what, what, like, what sponsorship should I bring on? Uh, what do I actually want to do with the channel? What am I trying to accomplish with the channel? Like when you know who it is that you're making content for, it kind of helps all of those things align and just helps you answer things a lot more clearly. Because then all you have to do <clears throat> is you have to say, okay, well, is this going to be a good fit? for what I'm trying to do, yes, okay? Is this gonna be a good fit for the people that I'm trying to reach with my content and the people that I'm serving? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay, well then in that particular case, let's roll with it, let's publish that video or whatever. Um, and it just kind of helps make things, you know, um, uh, a lot easier and it helps make make the entire process uh, um, a lot more, you kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? I guess that's, another, that, that's a way to put it. Another thing that made a big deal for me um, is the <clears throat> the way that I that I approach things. So when I was first starting my YouTube channel, and you know some of you might be in in this scenario too, but when I was first starting my YouTube channel, I didn't share it with anybody. Um, I kept it to myself. Um, and the reason for that is because I was like, man, I don't I don't know, you know, like if I show it to somebody, are they going to like laugh at me because I have a YouTube channel or whatever? I was kind of insecure about it. And that same person that I ended up you know working with on that other channel. Um, they gave me a lot of confidence because basically 
they had tons of experience at that time. They worked with tons of big brands on YouTube. They worked with some of the largest creators on the platform, still do. And um, in that particular scenario, they reached out and they're like, yeah, I, I think that you, you know, like your video production's good, how you present is good. Um, I think that you have that, you know, thing um, for YouTube. And that by itself with somebody with that experience, um, it meant a lot to me. And it was like, wow, maybe I do have, you know, maybe I can turn this into something. And it kind of, you know, kind of changed the way that I looked at what it was that I was doing. And then from there, um, um, as part of that perspective, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to, you know, um, try to do this in a serious manner, then in that particular case, I'm going to start handling everything it is that I'm doing like I'm a professional content creator, even though I wasn't full time yet. So I was like, okay, everything that I'm doing, I'm going to, you know, get my workflow together like a professional content creator would, I'm going to start publishing consistently, I'm going to start doing like all these things. And just like a professional content creator would because I was trying to be a full time professional content creator. So I was like, okay, let's, you know, start doing all the things that professional content creators do. And so I had to modify my lifestyle a little bit, had to modify my mindset a little bit. Um, and then I started, you know, kind of walking down that path. So I wouldn't say that it was like one thing um, that, you know, made uh, that made everything click. I would say it was like a series of things um, that, you know, that that kind of, you know, aligned up well that uh, that, you know, gave me it wasn't about uh, things clicking as much as it was about just the encouragement. And the belief in myself is like weird and, you know, woo woo as that sounds. Um, I think it was, you know, a, a mixture of those, you know, of those things. YouTube's creator liaison, Renee Ritchie in the house. What's going on, dude? Hope you are doing fantastic. Nice to see you in here. Christina Smallhorn, also in the house. What's going on, Christina? Hope that you are doing great as well. Colin Michael, what's going on? Hope you're doing great. He says, the TED Talk of Primal Branding is a quick book summary. Yeah, I haven't seen the TED Talk. Uh, haven't seen the TED Talk on it. Um, let's see. I mean, now you can probably just go into chat GPT and be like, Hey, give me a, a summary. But, but I think one of the things that's good about the book, cause you can do, listen to the audio version too, is just kind of, you know, listening to the details, right. And you get all the nuance because, you know, you can be like, Hey, what are the, you know, seven things or whatever. But like, you know, when you hear all the details around it, it kind of helps it click, at least for me, you know, I mean, everybody's different. Um, let's see here. We did the Nightingales Japan. So next up on our list here, run number 22 already. We're cruising through these. So uh, if you are just joining us, what we're doing is we're talking about all things related to YouTube. So if you're a YouTube content creator, um, you're in the right place. Um, the questions that I'm answering are coming from the form that I put down in the description of this stream. So uh, if you have a question that you would like answered, make sure you put it in the stream or make sure you put it in that form. I'm trying to get through as many as I possibly you know, can during the stream. Where I'm at right now, we should get to... Like if you put it in there now, we should get to it. Um, if you are watching on the vertical side, um, I recommend that you just click on my channel name, go to my channel, find the landscape live stream, and then the description's down there. I'm working on a website redirect. So next time I do this, I should have that um, to where you'll just be able to put in that website name and then just go fill in the form there. But right now I don't have it. So because of that, um, if you do want your question answered, make sure you put it in that. If not, you know, you can just sit back and listen because there's a lot of really great questions coming in. Um, and even if you don't have a question of your own, somebody else might ask a question that you didn't know that you had, right? So, uh, so definitely sit back and enjoy if you are a YouTube content creator. So uh, Mogami, Love the channel names. Been on YouTube for a year or more. They do geek culture and VTuber content. The goal of the channel is to try to make YouTube a career and show my talent as a writer and artist. Question, how do I niche down from having so many interests and figure out a mascot slash VTuber model that can incorporate many different interests? So here's what you want to do. <clears throat> is you want to... You want to... Uh, figure out like the thing that you enjoy doing the most. And the reason that you want to do that is because if you figure out what it is that you enjoy the most, um, then you can ensure that you are going to be happy with, you know, being a content creator into the future. The worst thing that you can do is, in my opinion, is start making content about something just because you think it might do well. And then you might end up in a situation to where, you know, you grow a channel around it and then you're like, oh, you know what, this isn't really what I want to do. And then in that particular case, you know, um, because, you know, you'll be known for it, you know, when you go places, people will know you from that. Maybe you'll be on podcasts and, you know, people's live streams and things like that, talking about what it is that you do. And, you know, you'll be known for that thing. So because of that, it's important to just pick the thing that you're the most interested in and roll with that. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to all your different interests, it's also important to know that everybody has a bunch of different interests, right? Like everybody's interested in different things. Um, but when it comes to YouTube, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're thinking that, um, you know, people watch YouTube videos because they're interested in something, right? That could be the way that the content creator entertains. Like, for example, Casey Neistat's niche is entertainment, right? 
He's he's not necessarily, I mean, he's a vlogger, but he's an entertainer. That's his that's his thing. Um, mine is education, right? Um, specifically for YouTube content creators. And with Casey Neistat, if you want to be entertained and watch somebody, you know, put together really interesting stories about regular life, then in that case, you know you can go to his channel and every video that you watch on his channel is going to be something that is going to satisfy that for you. If you're somebody that wants to know about YouTube and you know how to do all the YouTube stuff, you know that you can come to my channel and I probably got a video on that thing that you're trying to figure out. Um, when it comes to, you know, everybody here in the chat right now, same exact thing. Like, you know, you know, like, you know, Shark Scrapper, you know, if I was getting into scrapping, then in that particular case, his whole entire channel is about scrapping. So I'd be like, okay, if I'm trying to learn, you know, scrapping and, you know, how to figure out the things that are valuable and things like that, then I would go watch him because I would know that that's his, you know, like he's got tons of content on it and I would learn a ton from his channel. So when it comes to deciding on that thing that you want to do, um, I would first think about, you know, like what is it that you enjoy doing the most? And then two, think about, okay, um, how can I actually build this for uh, people that are also interested in this thing? And what type of content can I publish that will serve them in some way? You know, in your particular case, because you're doing like VTubers and geek culture and stuff. So in that particular case, then then, uh, you know, around the geek culture, then, you know, the, the geek culture enthusiast or, you know, geeks essentially would be your target audience. Um, within geek culture, there's tons of different things. So then within that, I would try to find, at least when you're starting, I would try to find a narrow area of geek culture to step into. And the reason for that is because if somebody comes in and they're interacting with one video and YouTube detects it and they're like, hey, this the system is like, hey, you know, people are really enjoying this video, then what's going to happen next is your other videos on your channel that the system thinks is a good fit for that person, YouTube's gonna show you those videos to, to that person too. And if that person continues to click and watch those videos, then one, they can become part of your community, but two, that also tells YouTube like, hey, this person's really into this, so therefore, what other people do we have in our system that are using and interacting with YouTube like this person is? And let's test this content against them and see if they also enjoy it. And then if they do, then that, just, that whole thing just rinses and repeats over and over again. Um, and that's how you ultimately end up, you know, being in front of the right people with pretty much everything it is that you publish. But, you know, it's, it's really easy to be like, hey, I want to make videos about a little bit of everything. And you can do that. Like there isn't there isn't a rule that says you can't do that. But if you're somebody that's like, hey, I want to, you know, grow as fast as I possibly can on YouTube and give myself the best possible chance of like really kind of breaking out here, then in that case, defining an audience that you're after and, and serving that audience in the best way that you possibly can and continuing to show up for them over time um, is the is the best way to do that. Andrew Cannon in the house. What's up, dude? Hope you're doing great. Nice to see you in here. Tish, Artist Haven, hope you are doing fantastic as well. Nice to see you here too. So uh, let's see here. So next up on our list here, draw or die. Hey, what's going on, dude? Hope you're doing fantastic. Nice to see you in here. Seeing you pop up over here on the uh, vertical side. Love it. Game Punk, what's going on? Hope you're doing great. Cosplays, DJ808 says, uh, what horizontal chat? What kind of magic is this? So, so basically, I'm I'm streaming vertical um, to the short shelf right now, or the vertical feed that shows up in the short shelf, um, and then I'm streaming, um, you know, normally here uh, as well. So uh, the form for the questions is in the other feed, the the landscape feed, because we don't have the option to add links to uh, to the shorts anymore. To get to the horizontal chat, DJ808, love your channel name, by the way. Um, to get to the horizontal chat, just click on my channel name. And then once you click on the channel name, then the next thing that you want to do is um, just click on my name, you know, at the top of that screen, because that'll just take you into the short time guessing from the live. I'm not sure. Um, but then uh, from there, then just click on my live tab, and then you'll see the, the live stream that's happening right now. If you click on my channel page, you might see it there too. Next up. We've got number 23, cruising through these. So we got Denise Smith Creative. Denise Smith Creative uploads one time per week or more. The type of channel is watercolor. The goal of the channel says I want to grow and make money. And the question is, I finally got to 1,003 subscribers. Now it's about watch time, I think. Any advice? More live streams? Question mark. So first off, high five and fist bump to you for your first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, so when it comes to the watch time, 
keep doing what you're doing. Make sure that you're putting out videos that, you know, they're that are long enough that people will watch them, you know, for, you know, a decent amount of time. Pay attention to your audience retention reports. Make sure that you are looking for the places and the things that you're doing in your videos that people, you know, that cause people to leave. Do less of those things. Do more of the things that cause people to stick around. In addition to that, make sure that you are making it easy for people to find more of your content. I call this a watch time trap because it sounds fancy, but really all it is is make sure that with every video that you publish, that there's a clear path to another piece of content that somebody can watch that is relevant to that first video that they came in on. So let's say, for example, if you had videos about, uh, because your channel is about watercolor. So let's say you had a video about, you know, the best watercolor paints. Then in that particular case, the video that you hand them off to might be the best paintbrushes for watercolor. Um, And you basically just think about it through that lens. If they're watching this video on the best watercolor paints, then in that case, you know, what would make the most sense for me to recommend them to watch next. And then you make sure that you have those end screens. In addition to that, make sure that you're using your pinned comments that also leads people into individual videos or playlists that are also relevant to the thing that they are interacting with in that moment. Also make sure that you have your channel page set up properly where you have playlists that are added as sections to your channel page. You get 12 different sections that you can add. So the idea is that you categorize your content based around things that people are coming to your channel for. And then you line them up on your channel page and you add them to your channel pages sections based on the things that people are coming to you the most for. And you find that out by going into your analytics. And um, if you just scroll to the bottom of the page on that first page that you come to in your analytics, then you're going to see all the videos that are bringing in the most traffic to your channel at this moment in time. And then you basically prioritize the, uh, the playlist based on that so that For the people that do go to your channel page, um, which, you know, most of will end up just going into like playlists or, you know, click on other videos or clicking on the videos that YouTube recommends. But for the people that go into the playlist uh, or that go to your channel page, then you also have it easy for them to find the content that they care about there. In addition to that, also putting um, playlists down in your video descriptions. Like, let's say, for example, you know, you have videos on like different paints of watercolor, then in that case, making sure that you have a playlist of those and you put that in all your different uh, video descriptions. If you have it about brushes or other things that you use to paint, making sure that you have playlists of those. If you have techniques, then put playlist of those, that type of thing. Um, but basically, you want to put those in your videos so that people can also find those for the people that go down to your video descriptions. The most activity that you're going to get on anything is going to come from YouTube's recommendation system and YouTube search or people sharing your content out somewhere. Um, But all of those little things that I just explained will help you be able to fully capitalize on the traffic or the viewership, all the people that are coming in and interacting with the content, um, whichever way it is that they come into it. Uh, Let's see here. Next up on the list here, we've got... And really quick, uh, read the Lunar Echo. It says, how can I start having some um, some income as a small channel who has only 2,000 subscribers before getting monetized? So I have a video on my channel that talks about um, different ways that you can monetize as a new creator that's not in the partner program yet. But just off the top of my head, here's some. So one is uh, you can have merch. Um, With merch, that's usually like a low yield thing um, when it comes to merch, but you can do merch. Um, You can do merch. You can uh, bring attention to things as an affiliate as long as your content type supports it. Most things do have affiliate programs for them. And the way that you would find that is you just hop on Google and you would say affiliate programs for and then fill in whatever it is that you do. So affiliate programs for gaming, um, affiliate programs for basketball, affiliate programs for football, affiliate programs for home repair, affiliate programs for whatever. And then it's going to give you, you know, those things. Um, Making your own products of some kind um, that you can lead people to um, can also, you know, generate, you know, good income as well. Um, And you can do all of those things. Those are just a few off the top of my head. Um, But you can do all those things um, while you are trying to get into the YouTube partner program. And Depending on how things go, unless you're getting just tons and tons and tons of views, there's a really good chance that if you do that stuff uh, properly, that that those things will end up generating more revenue for you long term anyway. So um, getting those things in place is definitely important. However, um, it's also important to make sure that you are focused on the thing that's most important, which is how do I serve the people that I'm making content for? And when you focus on that and you learn how to make the best possible content for those people, then in that particular case, um, it's going to give you, you know, the best advantage all the way around for anything that you're promoting, for ad revenue, for reaching whatever goals it is that you have on YouTube. So, uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps. 
Luke Nightingale. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. Says Daryl said music channels are oversaturated. What about music education, Cubase, native instrument production, and other music related tips and VSTs? So um, those are educational channels. So if you are wanting to make an educational channel, then 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 you're good to go. So when it comes to YouTube, um, you know, there are, you know, things that have lots of competition in them where a lot of content creators are really good at making that content that definitely exists. But most when it comes to like saturation, most of that is happening like down here, because most people won't do what it takes in order to get their content to here, right? So because of that, a lot of the saturation is happening down here. But if you can, you know, learn how to get your audience to respond better to your content by really paying attention to what they're, you know, how they're responding to things um, and just experimenting with your content, figuring out, you know, uh, the things that you can do that will keep them watching longer and all that, then, and just coming up with different topic ideas around the things that you make, trying to come up with unique stuff, things like that, then that can get you, that can get you to here, right? So I watch tons right now because I, I do uh, some music production, um, you know, through Logic Pro. Um, I'm also learning how to play the guitar right now. I've got a hand pan that, you know, that I'm learning how to play. Um, you know, I've got, you know, all of that stuff. So because of that, I watch a lot of music education channels, even like learning how to mix a little bit better. Like I don't go too far down that rabbit hole like my brother does. Like he goes really down the mixing rabbit hole, but I'm just trying to get it to where like I can just listen to it in my car, right? Or maybe I can like mix it good enough to where I can play it in a live stream or something, right? But like uh, um, when it comes to that type of thing, I think that you still have a wide open, uh, a wide open thing there. So there are tons of great content creators that are making really good videos about how to do all the music production stuff. So look at them, go and, you know, just hop into YouTube search and look for some of those channels. If you're already watching some of them, then you're going to get recommended those channels anyway, but go and watch them and be like, okay, is the content that I'm making, um, can I compete with these people? And if the answer to that is like, not yet, then get to work on it and start publishing videos and make those videos maybe search targeted so that you can at least, you know, try to compete there and do some, you know, keyword research and look for things that have a high search volume, but not as much competition. So you can kind of get in there. Um, but, but basically go through the process of learning how to compete with them, right? Through learning how to make better videos, learning how to come up with video, better video ideas, <clears throat> learning how to make better thumbnails, those sorts of things. Um, but absolutely, I believe, that if you look at them and you're like, yeah, I, I can compete here um, or I'm, I can't now, but I'm going to learn how. And the way that I learn how is through publishing videos on a regular basis until I hit that level. Then in that particular case, if you're aggressive, then yeah, you can compete. Um, um, but if you're like, hey, I'm just going to kind of publish what I want and not really pay attention. Um, and I'm just going to do some Cubase over here. And then I'm going to do some logic over here and some Fruity Loops over here. Then in that particular case, you're kind of, you know, um, you know, you would be working against yourself and you might end up in that oversaturated area. Um, but if you're like, hey, I'm going to focus on being like the best Cubase channel on YouTube, um, then in that particular case, you know, you'll, you, you, you probably will be um, if you, you know, if you put that effort into it. So uh, let's see here. So next up on our list here, we've got a girl in her passport uploads one time per week or more. She has travel content. The goal of the channel is to inspire and help people travel. The question is, I'm thinking about doing a vertical live at a travel location, but there'll be a long form video later. Do you think it might be too much or do you think they are two separate types of audiences? Um, I think it's two separate formats. So um, so there's gonna be people that will, so here's something that I wanna talk about real quick when it comes to shorts. And really quick, uh, Renee, uh, Richie, he just said that uh, Cleo Abram just got 2 million subs in two years um, as a music uh, creator. So when it comes to uh, YouTube shorts, here's something that I, that I want everybody to think about. So right now, there's all these videos going out. YouTube shorts, you know, destroy my channel. Just like the videos that were going out about how, uh, you know, everybody's quitting YouTube, right? So it's like once people see those videos are doing well, and I've been tempted too, but like once those people see those videos doing well, then it's like, hey, let me hop on this because, you know, these videos do well. So sometimes people are sharing their experiences. Sometimes people are making content just because it's kind of trending in the niche right now. But when it comes to YouTube shorts, one thing that that is really important to make sure that everybody, you know, kind of uh, um, internalizes is that when it comes to shorts, it's important to think at, at scale when it comes to shorts. So absolutely, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to interact with your YouTube shorts that aren't going to, you know, click on your channel name. They're not going to explore you. They're not going to go see what else you have. They're going to enjoy that short. Maybe they're going to see some other shorts because they enjoyed that short or whatever, but they're not going to care enough in order to go and, and watch some of your long form content. And that's fine. 
What you're looking for is you're looking for at scale. So let's say that you have 100 people that watch your short. Well, out of that 100 people, maybe nobody comes over into your video. But let's say you have one out of 100 that go and they subscribe to your channel and they go in and they start watching some of your other videos. Well, in that particular case, if you start getting 10,000 views on your shorts, then you're going to have more people that go over and start interacting, right? So, so the idea when it comes to shorts is to just think at scale and think like, okay, I'm not trying to get everybody. I mean, it would be great, but I'm not trying to get every single person that interacts with my short to go over and participate in my long form content. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get in front of new people and those new people just happen to be hanging out in YouTube shorts, right? People that maybe I might not have gotten in front of with my long form content because maybe they might not have clicked on it. Now I have this opportunity to introduce myself to them through YouTube shorts. And if they enjoy the content there, some people will go and they will, you know, go to the other content. But the the thing to make sure that, that everybody focuses on though, when it comes to that is make sure that everything aligns. And what I mean by that is, you know, since, since Tiffany here has a, a travel channel, what I mean by that is <clears throat> if you're publishing travel content and let's say you're doing destination stuff like she is, well, in that particular case, <clears throat> if she's doing long form content and that long form content is also mixing in some like travel tips and, you know, things like that, then that's fine. Um, but the, the thing is if people are watching like vlogs, like if they're not actually going somewhere and they're just living through your experiences because you're vlogging your travel experiences, that's a different type of viewer than the type of person that's watching a travel video because they're going to a location and they're trying to figure out the best places to go. And you're going to all these different locations. and They're trying to figure out the best places to go there because they travel. And with those people, they're also looking because they're travelers. Maybe you can make content about backpacks and about, you know, different things that you use for travel and, you know, that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the people that are kind of living vicariously through the creator, totally different audience there. So if you are making content for shorts and you're doing uh, even live streams, whatever, if you're doing it for shorts, um, then you just want to make sure that it's in alignment with what happens on your with your main content too. That's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to get to. So in your case, Tiffany, I think you're totally fine um, doing that because your content is, you know, for travelers, your content's for people that are going places. So because of that, you're probably going to get a lot of people in there that are just like interested in like, oh, wow, this looks cool. That looks like a nice location, whatever. But what you're really doing there is you're just putting a bunch of hooks in the pond. I think it was D that, that mentioned this, but you're, but you're putting like a bunch of, of hooks in the water. And then, you know, some, some of them are going to get bites, right? And they'll end up, you know, coming over to your regular content, but just think of it like, okay, a majority of the people here, just like, you know, watching in the vertical feed right now, if you are not a regular viewer of my content, some of you, if you're a content creator, you might be like, hey, this is my first time seeing Nick. This stuff sounds good. I'm going to go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. There might be some people that come in from that. Um, but on the, uh, on the other side of that, if they didn't see me in the vertical shelf, there's a possibility that YouTube might not have even recommended my landscape long form, uh, my landscape stream to them. So because of that, um, I would do it. And, uh, and I would just look at it through the lens of like, Hey, as long as it's, as long as I'm doing the same thing, right. As long as I'm targeting the same people in the, in the, with my shorts live stream, my vertical live stream, then I'm, then I'm going for it. Right. But if I'm going to be doing something completely different then in that case, you know, it might not be, it might not be the best move, best move. Andrew can says, if you're enjoying the live stream, please leave a like. I agree with that 1000%. If you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. All right. Next up on our list here, uh, we've got Stevan Next Level Mindset. Um, they upload one time per week or more. They do inspirational and motivational content. The goal of the channel is to go full time and create an income while providing valuable content. The question is, I want to do vertical live streams, but YouTube automatically reverts them to private when finished. Why is this? And doesn't this cause you to lose the live views and watch time? Thanks. Yes, it does cause you to lose those things. But what you want to do is you want to go into your live stream settings um, and you can decide if your video is going to be unlisted or not. So in order to do that, um, you need to go into the create option of your live stream. So basically get everything scheduled up um, and then go into the actual youtube.com interface there, not on your phone, do it on your a computer or in desktop mode on your phone in the creator studio or studio.creators, uh, sorry, studio.youtube.com. Go into the live stream settings and then you'll be able to check the toggle there to make sure that it doesn't unlist the, the live stream once it's finished. All right, next up on our list here, we've got 
Uh, Charlie Grace Adventure. Charlie Grace Adventure says that they do daily content. Um, it is a RV travel and van life channel. The goal of the channel is just hit my 1 million views. New goal is 25,000 subscribers. Absolutely love it. A million views. First 1 million views. Love it. So, uh, uh, so the question here is how can I take older videos and get more traction with them on YouTube? Um, or then end card all oh, other than end cards. Um, if I change the title or thumbnail, does it pop on YouTube as a newer video? So here's what happens is when you are changing thumbnails and titles on your videos, YouTube is still going to give them impressions just like they are currently. If people start responding to them better based on the changes that you made, then YouTube will show it to more people. Um, but it can also go in the other way. So if you update your title and thumbnail and people respond less, then in that case, it can actually do damage to the video. So like, let's say you have a video that's getting, you know, 10 views a day or 100 views a day or something like that. And then you make a change, that change could drop it down to five views a day, or, you know, maybe zero, you know, depending on how people respond to it. So it can go in, in two different directions. But in addition to the end screens, you can obviously do, uh, you know, uh, your uh, uh, pinned comments as well. You can do cards um, in your videos also. You can also add those videos to playlists that you're sending to uh, people into. Um, but again, you just want to make sure that, you know, the playlist is made around the interest of the viewer. You don't want to just be like, hey, these videos suck or they're just not getting a good response. So because of that, I'm just going to put them on a playlist and try to get people into that playlist. Don't do that. Um, instead, you want to, you know, make sure that, you know, that that people are enjoying those videos um, and, and that they're relevant to <clears throat> whatever content that you're sending them there from. Another thing that you can do is with each individual video that you're like, hey, I would like to, you know, just bring more attention to this video again, is you do have a community feed on your YouTube channel. So with that community feed, you can recommend that video and you can say, hey, you know, this is uh, something that, you know, people really enjoyed, you know, in the past. So, uh, you know, if you're new to my channel, maybe you haven't seen this yet, um, make sure that you check this out. And then from there, some people that see that community post will go in there and, and, and check it out. So uh, because of that, you know, there are things that you can do to bring attention to it um, or slightly modify, you know, the response in one way or the other. Um, but in terms of, you know, the system doing something different, uh, Renee right here works at YouTube as YouTube's creator liaison. He says, um, YouTube doesn't re-index or retest based on metadata or thumbnail changes. But if those changes affect or, um, engagement, the system will follow that. For example, if people click more. So yeah, so that's, that's more of an official um, answer, um, but, you know, in addition to the other stuff about, you know, just ways to put it in front of more people. Next up, we got DIY microbiology. That sounds cool. Uh, it's a DIY channel. The goal of the channel is fun and to share. And the question is how to be more authentic for doing voiceover videos. So when it comes to, um, I had to mute that. So when it comes to uh, being authentic when you're doing voiceovers, the the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to, uh, one, to just talk to the microphone like you're talking to like a friend, but just add just like a little bit of energy to it because, you know, maybe if you're talking to a friend, maybe you're a little bit monotone or something like that. So, you know, you want to, you know, make it sound a little bit interesting. So you might want to add just a smidge of energy to it, but, you know, you don't need to go over the top. Um, but just talk to the microphone like you're talking to a buddy of yours. Like pretend that you're on like a Zoom call and you're excited about this information that you're going to be sharing with your buddy. So it's not like, hey, you know, we're just hopping on a call and talking about something. It's like, it's more of an approach in terms of the tone. Like, hey, uh, we're hopping on this call because I have to show you this thing that I just got and you're going to love it, right? So it's kind of that approach. Um, in addition to that, another thing, and I actually ran across this tip uh, from somebody else and I thought it was really good. I actually shared it with a friend of mine who's struggling to make videos right now. And um, uh, this particular tip, I thought was really good. It's a creator on TikTok, um, and his tip was to give yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, his tip was to give yourself, uh, no matter what happens, even if you nail it on the first take, give yourself three credit takes. So basically, if you're recording something, instead of being like, okay, I have to nail it on this first shot, just be like, okay, I'm going to do this three times, regardless of how good it is. 
um, or at least three times, regardless of how good it is. And then that way you kind of build in some cushion and it kind of helps you work against being like a perfectionist and things like that. Because then it's like, you know, like I'm going to try to nail it and it kind of takes some of that pressure off because then you're like, I don't have to nail it on the first time. Um, I thought that was a really good tip. I haven't experimented with that yet. Um, but <clears throat> I think I won't ever experiment with that because, you know, I've made enough videos to where it's just kind of the process now and I just expect it. <laughs> so I don't expect to nail it, you know, on the first, uh, on the first thing, but, uh, but I thought that was a really good tip because it kind of lets you be easy on yourself, you know, when you're doing it. But yeah, I would just, I would just talk to the microphone like you're talking to a buddy that you, you know, are trying to show something that you're excited about. Like if you talk to a buddy, you're not gonna be like, oh my gosh, you got to check out this thing, right? You're just gonna be like, oh man, this is great. Yeah, get, check out this, you know, this thing that I got. Uh, it's awesome. It does this, blah, blah, blah. Andrew Can says, hey, Nick, are you enjoying the Elgato prompter? So I am. So I used this the first time on the stream that I did with Daryl, and um, it was awesome for just having like the introductory stuff on there and just kind of reading through that. Um, I used it in uh, to get through the uh, video recording or the voiceover part, essentially, for uh, the video that's publishing tomorrow on how to go live vertically. Um, and... I thought that I was going to put the chat on it here during the stream from the vertical stream that's rolling so that I'd be able to see both of, you know, both chats right here instead of having to look over here for that chat. And uh, when I did that, it put this like white cloud over the stream. So I do have a dark mode plugin that I could probably use uh, for that to minimize that. But because it created that error, it's something that I'll work on later and just kind of fine tune it from there. Uh, but I absolutely love the, uh, I love, you know, having the option for it um, because it does have a teleprompter mode. So basically uh, w when I was going through like the step-by-step -step stuff for the, for the, how to vertically live stream, I just sit there and I just read it. And what's cool is because there's not tons of eye movement because it allows you to kind of narrow down your teleprompter still there, but not a ton. So if I need to show myself, you know, in order to kind of break things up a little bit from the monotony of the tutorial, um, then I can, I can do that. I can just cut to it and then it just kind of looks normal for a second. And then, you know, it'll go back to the, uh, to the screen stuff. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it so far. Still learning how to do the whole teleprompter thing. Um, I tried it in the past. I've got like a really nice teleprompter, but this is actually way better, uh, and cheaper, but the, uh, uh, teleprompters for me, they kind of suck the life out of what it is that you're doing, but it's good for just like keeping notes, but I'm trying to get better at it. Um, because I definitely see the efficiency win, uh, you know, with a teleprompter, but it's just not, you know, it, it just like, I'm not as authentic when I'm communicating with a teleprompter. So I'm working on that. Um, so the channel name here is guess what? Guess what? And really quick, Largemouth Legend, um, they mentioned, um, how do I get my videos in the YouTube Shorts algorithm? So as soon as you publish your short, um, it's going into the YouTube Shorts algorithm. So how your video performs is going to be dependent on how people are interacting with that content. If it ca causes a lot of, you know, engagement in terms of watch time, shares, you know, people re-watching it, um, those types of things, then um, in that particular case, you know, it'll probably do well. But if people come into that short and then they just leave quickly or they swipe away really fast, then that short's probably not going to get very far. There's nothing you can do. Just a quick, you know, disclaimer I want to throw out there. There's nothing that you can do to shortcut or game or trick or do anything um, to like YouTube's algorithm. The whole thing is based on response. So look at it like a mirror. So if your videos are doing well, that means that what you're putting out, and you can see all this reflect in your analytics too, but that means that what you're putting out is um, it's at a level within the system that it's competitive against other content that, you know, that it's being shown against. So that means when people are opening up home pages, things like that, or they're looking for specific search results, stuff like that, then they're choosing your videos. And when they choose your videos, they're, they're getting a good experience out of your content. Um, when that happens, then YouTube shows your content to more people. And there's, there's nothing that you can do to shortcut good content. Like you, you have to get your content to a level to where, um, to where it's competitive within the system. And when you do that, you'll immediately notice, you know, you'll, you'll start getting better results with, you know, most things or all things that you, uh, that you publish. And, you know, sometimes 
you know, depending on the content creator, some people nail it every time. I'm not one of those creators. I, I, I'll nail it sometimes. And then sometimes I put out stuff because it was either requested or somebody mentioned it in a live stream, or I just think it's something that people need, or I see a conversation happening on like Reddit and Facebook and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, I got to get in on this and make a video about something related to this. So I can kind of, you know, kind of say my piece on that thing or whatever. Um, so, you know, there's all those variables too. So, you know, it really comes down to, you know, what it is you're trying to do. But uh, guess what is our next channel here? The type of channel they have is Nature Facts. The goal of the channel is to have fun and spread knowledge. The question is, is TTS considered AI? Um, English is not a first language. And I'm kind of dyslexic and reading a script would be too hard for me. Um, so you can use AI voice with what it is that you're doing. But keep in mind, some people are, you know, kind of turned away or turned off by that. Um, you also are going to need to disclose to YouTube that it is AI, uh, you know, generated. So, you know, just keep that in mind because that's part of the part of the thing now. But if English is not your first language, what I recommend is that you use a dubbing service. So we had Daryl Eves on here a couple of weeks ago, um, or we actually did a dedicated stream. Actually, he launched a service called Ditto Dubbing, um, where you can uh, basically go in there and you can take your videos and you can do your videos in your native language. And then you can go in there and you can actually convert them over into English and then you can upload it in English and it's going to sound like your voice. Um, so, you know, you have those types of options as well. But keep in mind for that, um, you know, it, it, it all costs money. So, you know, you are going to, you know, need to be prepared to, you know, pay for those types of things. Next up, we got Traveling with Russell. Traveling with Russell does travel and supermarket tours. The goal of the channel is to show places on YouTube that were never on YouTube prior to me creating such videos. The question is, how quickly uh, do you move on if you get a nine or 10 video, a nine or 10 out of 10 video, publish the next video right away or give it some time? So um, when it comes to the 10 out of 10, um, I don't even pay much attention to that. The reason for that is because, you know, as you publish more videos, you're going to notice that, you know, when you first publish a video, it doesn't dictate the long-term performance of that video. Yes, if somebody, if, if it just gets flooded right out of the gate, there's a really good chance that it's probably going to do okay, at least for a little bit. But really, all that says is that the people that are already uh, engaged with what it is that you're doing are the most likely to engage with that content are responding well to it at that point in time. But it doesn't even mean that once it gets into a general audience that those people are even going to care. Um, so because of that, that one out of 10 metric is really misleading, in my opinion. Um, in addition to that, I've like I've seen it on a bunch of channels. I've had the experience myself many times where, you know, I'll publish something. It'll be like an eight, nine or 10, you know, at the time of publish. But then, you know, you give it a little bit of time and it ends up being in the top five. Right. So because of that, I always recommend I even have a short on my channel about this saying, don't even look at that. Like, don't take it like take all of that information um, on the one out of 10 just with a grain of salt, because, you know, another thing to consider when it comes to that one out of 10 graphic and let me know what what your thoughts are on this. Like, let me know in the chat right now. Do you pay much attention to that one out of 10? Um, um, I'm just curious to know, you know, on, on your side, like your perspective of it. But, you know, one thing to remember is like, OK, let's say that you put out um, 10 videos and those 10 videos, it's not the best you've done. Maybe you're a little bit lazy, whatever. Maybe you didn't spend as much time on them as you should have. You're just trying to get videos out so you can stay consistent, whatever the thing is, or you're just learning how to make videos still. Let's say you put out 10 videos and out of those 10 videos, they're just all not that great, right? Then let's say you put out video number 11. Well, with video number 11, it just has to be a little bit better than all of those 10 videos in terms of the response. And then it'll instantly go to number one right? They're not instantly, but it'll quickly go to number one. So if you have, you know, some bad videos, it's pretty easy to beat those bad videos, which can also make that the higher numbers in the one out of 10 uh, kind of misleading too. Now, if everything you're publishing is crushing, then in that particular case, it's a little bit different because then you can be like, hey, you know, within this first amount of time, this is what I had before and I'm actually lagging behind that, blah, blah. So it's a little bit different there. But like, you know, most of the people that are hanging out here and both sides are, uh, you know, newer content creators for, uh, for you guys. Yeah, don't don't even worry about that uh, too much. Just focus on like, okay, um, how far did people make it in this video? How often are people clicking on this video? And thinking about things like, okay, are the videos that I'm publishing, in terms of the things that are more important, are the videos that I'm publishing um, of interest 
topically to just a large amount of people within my niche versus, you know, being of interest to just a small amount of people in my niche. Um, You know, thinking of those types of things, um, I think is a better place to spend your time. And also your click through rate, because if you can't get people to click, if you're making, you know, landscape content, if you can't get people to click, then nothing else can happen. So, you know, it's important to make sure that you're paying attention to that. And it's important to pay attention to your audience retention reports. If you can get people clicking at a competitive rate, or we'll just say a high rate, and you can get people enjoying your content at a competitive or high rate, um, and you can see how people are enjoying your content compared to other content by selecting in your audience retention reports that compared to other videos, you can see exactly how you're competing against other videos of similar length. So then you can say, okay, um, if this is, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that I'm going against, if I find that I'm like underperforming compared to other videos, then I need to get to work on trying to learn how to make my videos better. And there's tons of it. There's tons of, you know, channels out there that teach people how to edit, that teach people about, you know, making, you know, video content, um, mostly around editing, um, you know, definitely watch, you know, some of those channels to, you know, learn how to, you know, edit better and all that stuff and to just, you know, tell better stories and put, you know, content together better. But, you know, if you focus on people clicking on your videos in terms of, you know, the stats around that in your audience retention reports. Um, and then of course, making sure that your content is landing for your audience and the people that you're trying to reach. If you focus on those things, um, then, then you'll do fine. Um, because it's really easy to get lost in all these other things and to see things like that one out of 10 graph and be like, Oh no, blah, blah. And let it kind of disrupt your, your focus. Um, uh, because you feel you're underperforming. Don't let that happen. Instead, um, you know, focus on, you know, the things that will actually move the needle for you. Yeah, and and this is a good example too. Traveling with Russell says, you know, and this is on the extreme other side of this. He says, Mr. B said that um, he'll never reach another one out of 10 video. Um, However, to do so, it needs to break every record YouTube keeps on video uploads, <laughs> right? Because he's broken all the records. So like, you know, so on the extreme side, you also have that. So then if he's not breaking a record, he probably feels like he's underperforming, right? So, uh, so yeah, it's not sure. I'm like, I understand why they put that in there, maybe to encourage people or whatever, but, uh, but it's really, uh, it's really unfortunate that that people kind of pin their their mind state right like like man this video sucks because it's a nine out of ten right so it might suck right now at the time of publish but you know it might end up being okay down the road so don't spend too much time on that one out of ten and renee ritchie also he mentions that the audience tab in analytics is especially amazing and a great place to uh spend some time yeah just understanding other videos that people are watching you know things like that um you know around your content and just understanding just more details around just the people in general that are interacting is important. Skull Plosion, what's going on? Hope you're doing great. Autumn Hathaway, nice to uh, see you in here. So next up, we've got uh, this DJ 808. Got it. Love the channel name. It's the 808 part. Yep. Love love the bass. Matter of fact, you're probably not going to be able. You're probably not going to hear this, but uh, my girlfriend and I we made a little fun thing right here yeah here it is right here this is about loving the base this whole thing is about loving the base i don't know if you're going to be able to hear this or not might end up sounding weird kind of being vulnerable here because we just do this stuff for fun so this isn't like a serious song I don't even know if you can hear that through here. Yeah, what she says right there is, I love the bass. So yeah, your 808 thing, absolutely love it for your channel name. But anyway, says, uh, let's see here. So the question is, um, the type of channel is an EDM mix artist, and I play the Pioneer uh, DDJ uh, 1000 controller at a very high level using creative vocal loops and instruments to make harmonic and energetic mixes that are unique and creative. The goal of the channel says, I want to reach a bigger audience. I also want to reach uh, 900. Uh, I'm currently at 889 currently and hoping for 1,000. Um, and I will then hopefully have mastered Ableton Live to produce and play my own tracks. The question is, can you give me a little recommendations um, on your stream to offer any advice that will help me reach a wider audience? Shorts, shorts, use shorts. So make your, you know, make your regular content 
but shorts, um, do shorts. I would even be live streaming DJ mixes. You got to be really careful though, because you have copyright stuff that you're going to have to deal with on YouTube. So you got to be really, really careful um, when it comes to the specific things you play. But once you're doing original stuff, then you can you can live stream. So like right now, while I'm streaming this landscape, I mean, you know, because you found me on the vertical side. Um, so you saw my live stream vertically. So I would be doing stuff like that. Like if I was, if I was trying to bring attention to a personality music channel, which is what you're doing, then in that particular case, I would absolutely be, um, I would be publishing to shorts um, most of the time. And then I would be doing like bigger releases in long form content. And, um, and then I would also be doing live streams for like live sets and stuff um, into vertical lives on YouTube uh, vertical. And I would also be doing the same exact thing. I'd be multicasting into TikTok uh, vertical and into like Instagram and anywhere else that you can live stream vertically to where it just shows up for people. Um, I would be doing that um, all the time. So basically I would wake up and I'd be like, what video am I making for it today? And I would also do things like, um, I don't know if you know who Connor Price is, um, but he blew up on TikTok and pretty much all over the place doing this, where instead of it just starting for the videos and it just starts and it's like just him jamming, instead he kind of builds like a little story into it. So it's like, hey, we're doing this and then this happens and then this happens and this character comes in and then like, bam, like, you know, then now here's the song. We start the song, right? Um, so I would look into him too and just kind of see the the path that he's kind of laid out for everybody because a lot of people are, are, are taking a similar path now to bring attention to their stuff. But yeah, I would I would be going vertical. Yeah, ham on all vertical stuff uh, if I was trying to do that. Okay, let's see here. Next up, we've got... Oh, and, and really quick, let me say why. Instead of just telling you, like, go to vertical, let me tell you why. Um, so when it comes to vertical content, the reason that that I would be doing that as a music channel is because when it comes to people clicking on your videos, um, when it comes to music, it's just a different thing. So when you are doing it vertically, it just shows up for people, right? So if somebody's sitting there in shorts, it just shows up. And then from there, you just have to be able to grab their attention. So, so you remove an entire part of the process, right? A huge barrier of getting people to click. So the long game, just so that I'm clear on that whole plan, the long game is that you are publishing shorts on a regular basis, right? Like, hey, I'm always putting shorts out and doing vertical lives, things like that um, on all the platforms. And then when I'm publishing the long form videos, I'm doing that as I'm getting people that are coming in and I keep seeing regular people and stuff like that in my live streams, keep seeing regular people showing up in my comments. So, and then I'm looking at my stats, I'm seeing people keep coming back to the channel, you know, when I'm publishing content, that's when you start doing releases in the long form, um, in the horizontal. And the whole idea there is that you are, you know, getting in front of people already in the short form. Some of those people are subscribing, they're, you know, engaging with what it is that you're doing anyway, so that when you publish the long form, some of those people might click on it, right? You still have the barrier of like, I got to, you know, learn how to get people to click on a piece of music content. Um, but, you know, some of those people might click on it because they are interacting with your short content and your vertical lives, which means that YouTube might recommend them some of your long form content um, as well. So that's the, that's the play. Uh, so here, next up, we got uh, Doc Mini CVS pronounced Doc Minicus. Oh, that's not the whole channel name. Okay. Whew. So Doc Minicus. Okay. Got it. <laughs> they do uh, historical documentaries. The goal of the channel is turning an interest into an additional source of income. The question is best way to drive more engagement, get comments and such. Um, asking people, ask people questions. So if you're, if you're wanting to get more comments on your videos, ask people questions in your content. You don't have to ask just one question. You can ask several questions throughout the content, depending on how long it is. But instead of saying things like leave a comment, when you say leave a comment, one of the things that you do is you're just like, hey, do something, right? Dance, monkey, right? That's what you're saying. But when you're like, uh, hey, you know, um, have you ever tried this before? Um, did you know about this? Um, you know, what was, you, what, what, uh, you know, what is your, uh, you know, what thing has stood out to you that you've learned so far in this video? Um, would you have, because you're on historical documentaries, would you have done the same thing in this situation? If not, what would you have done? Let me know in the comments, right? And the thing is, is when you, when you ask people um, a question, then it removes the hard part, right? So it's like, hey, make sure you leave a comment, like, and subscribe. In that particular case, what you're doing, <laughs> in that case, what you're doing is you're like, uh, is you're like hey, look, uh, do something, 
but I don't, I'm, but you're not really sure on what to do, right? Like, okay, I'm going to leave a comment, but what should I leave a comment about? Right. So because of that, when you ask a question, it removes that hurdle and it's like, okay, now I have to do is just answer this question. So, you know, if I, if I care enough and I am opinionated enough to, you know, want to insert what I would have done in this situation, then I'll, you know, then I'll, I'll leave that in the comment. Um, so, you know, the, just asking a question, um, is a, is a great way to increase the amount of uh, comments that you're doing. Um, let's see here. Next up. Oh, same thing for your likes too. You know, just reminding people to like, Hey, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, if you would have done that, you know, make sure you hit it, you know, make sure you hit the like button or, uh, you know, if you're enjoying this so far, hit the like button or, um, I'm trying to think of like a historical context of something. If you're doing like historical documentaries, um, like, let's say you're talking about like France or something or some like location somewhere in the world. And you're like, hey, uh, you know, hey, if you'd like to go to that place or, you know, if you've ever visited, I wouldn't say visited because that'd be a, a lower amount of people. But hey, like if that's somewhere you would like to visit sometime, you know, hit the like button or, you know, anything, just get creative. And and you'll see as long as you're tracking it, you'll be like, oh, interesting. When I ask these types of questions, they, you know, they, they seem to respond more. Shark Scrapper, next up on the list. What's up, my man? Hope you're on fantastic. He does infotainment content. The goal of the channel is adjunct to his overall recycling business and efforts. The question is, I frequently schedule my videos a week or more in advance um, and not usual to have six or more in the queue. My bids usually play while I'm busy recycling or picking up material, making it very challenging to leave a pinned comment with link to another video. Is it possible to leave a co uh, pinned comment before the video plays? If so, how? So if you make it unlisted and then you set an alarm on your phone um, and then you go in and you just flip it to public, then in that case, you give yourself the option to add a pinned comment. The problem is if you have it unlisted, you put the pinned comment in there, you get everything ready, and then you change it to scheduled, then in that case, it removes that for some reason, and I don't know why. Um, so because of that, if you are wanting to make sure that pinned comment is in there, then getting everything ready, get your pinned comment, get, you know, and everything else ready with the video, and then just schedule an alarm on your phone to go in and then hit to, to hit the publish button. Um, and with that, all you got to do is just have the creator, uh, the creator studio app on your phone or the YT studio app, I think is, is what it's called officially. Um, if you have that on your phone, that is, uh, that is all you need. YT studio, uh, is what it's called. So yeah, so as long as you have that right there for just in case uh you know in case you don't know about that it's this one oh it's closed hold on oops no don't want to do that yeah so it's this right here come on come on there we go top top uh the top one up there so uh so yeah so for that that's uh that's the that's the way to do that and still maintain all that stuff so uh let's see here next up on the list We've got my big dog life. Big dog life uploads every other day. They do pet and lifestyle content. Um, the goal of the channel is to inform and entertain lovers of Great Danes. Let me know if you have a dog. If you have a dog in the chat, just say uh, just say me. Purge of the BS. What's going on? Hope you are doing great. Well, let's see here. You watch One Piece? I did, uh, but I was actually like on my way to sleep, and I ended up falling asleep. Uh, let's see here. So. Uh, so the, hold on really quick. So Renee Ritchie says that it should preserve the comment if you switch to private or scheduled. Um, I'll check with the team on that. Thank you. Yeah, I've had that happen many times too to where I would schedule something and um, and it would remove the comment. So because of that, what I do now, um, and, and the last time I tried that, I think might have been, uh, I don't know, maybe three months ago or something. And um, what I do now is what I mentioned is to where I'll get everything ready and then I'll just set an alarm on my phone and then come in and trigger it manually. But, uh, but yeah, definitely, if you could just kind of run that one up that would be awesome um because it would be great if that could get fixed i guess i should have just sent that to you at that time um instead of waiting for you to like accidentally run across it in the live stream right <laughs> so uh on this channel here though uh it's a pet and lifestyle channel for my big dog life um, and the question is, I'm not yet mo a monetized channel, not yet a member of the YouTube partner program. I recently applied for affiliate marketing um, with a well-known pet co supply company. I was denied for affiliate marketing, but now the online company's ads are constantly being played before all my videos. Is there anything I can do about this, such as blocking the ads? So unfortunately, um, right now, no. But as soon as you get into the partner program, um, once you get access to that, then you can go into your AdSense settings and you can block them um, from advertising in your videos if you wanted to. So keep in mind, 
that is an ad, right? If people see that, then you would make money from that once you're in the partner program. But if you're wanting to do it out of spite, then yes, you can do that. So um, I have a video on my channel. I think the title is something about, and this is one of those videos that I published just to let people know about it because anytime I bring it up, people are like, oh my God, I didn't know you could do that. Um, but at scale, like, you know, people didn't, didn't seem to care in terms of, you know, when I published it. But um, the video is called something along the lines of like hidden YouTube ad settings or something like that is what you want to look for. And then it shows you how to do that. It shows you how to block like, you know, groups of ads. So if you don't want like political ads or religious ads or anything like that in your videos, you can block those. Um, if you want to block, like one thing that I recommend, just a little side, this is like a pro tip because I know I usually don't talk about this kind of stuff here. Um, but if you are a content creator that does affiliate marketing, um, one thing that uh, one thing that you can do is you can go in and you can take the uh, the URL of the thing that you are promoting as an affiliate. Like with Amazon, you don't really want to do it, but um, with anything else, um, if it's like you know a software product or something, you can take the URL of that or their advertising URL and you can actually put that into your AdSense and you can actually block them from advertising on your videos. And the reason that you would want to do this is because sometimes uh, you can actually end up in like a, an ad campaign and, it, and you're just kind of collateral damage. So like, let's say, for example, you're promoting um, Logitech, right? You have a video about a Logitech mouse and you're promoting it as an affiliate. Well, in that particular case, if Logitech runs some type of ad campaign um, for that mouse and it's like, hey, you know, anything that talks about this mouse, let's just run it on there too. Um, or for these audiences or whatever, and there's some crossover there, then in that particular case, that uh, that ad can show up on your video on the way in and kind of cut you out if they end up clicking on that because then they, they're they like, oh, hey, here's this ad about it and I am thinking about getting it anyway. So here, let me just click on it and go see what that's about. And then they end up making that purchase. Then you would take the L. Right. So when you um, add those things, then it kind of just limits your uh, ability to be the collateral damage from an ad campaign. And those types of things happen like it's not necessarily uh, malicious. It can be, but typically it's not um, to where, you know, the company is not like, hey, this video is doing great. It's sending us a lot of sales. So let's cut them out of it by drive by putting ads on the video. One. That can be kind of effective, but every person that's interacting with that video isn't going to see the ads anyway. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not going to be everybody, um, but you can end up taking a little bit of a hit, you know, there. Um, I learned that one the hard way. So um, I was doing those anyway, but um, I'm actually going to give you another pro tip here in just a second. But, um, but one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that happened to me was I was doing that a little bit, but I wasn't really paying much attention to it. And then I ended up uh, taking a hit I noticed on my two buddy sales. And I was like, Hey, what, what's going on? And, um, and then I had like, right when I was noticing that somebody, uh, mentioned in the comments, Hey, aha, I just saw an ad for this as I was coming into the video. And I was like, Whoa. And then at the time I hit them up and I was like, Hey, what's going on, blah, blah. blah. And they're like, Hey, we're just running this general campaign, whatever it just happened to, you know, show in front of your video. So then from that moment forward, I was like, anything that I promote, um, I'm going to add it to, uh, I'm going to add it, you know, the URL. So then that way I can't accidentally get caught up, you know, in that situation, unless they have like a specific advertiser UR URL that I just haven't, you know, picked up yet or something like that. Um, another tip, what was the other one I was going to give you? Oh, um, wait, what, what was it? Yeah, I was going to give you another one too, but I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. It was something related to all of that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I, I can't remember. It, it, it'll come up, uh, if it's, if it's important. Ron Strangs and Things says, I add pin comments and unlisted and then schedule and then the comments stick. I did it yesterday, in fact. Okay. So yeah, so it might be fine now. Yeah, in my experience, that's, um, you know, that kept knocking it out of there. So yeah, so that's that's good then. So uh, Renee, if you're still listening, uh, Ron trains and things. He did it and it and it was fine in his case. So he did it unlisted and then he scheduled it and then the, his comments stayed on there. So yeah, so uh, so that would still be cool if 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 that could be looked into. Um, just from the you know times that I tried that and it didn't work, just to see if it's something either channel related or if that was like a bug at that moment in time or something. So uh, let's see here. So Silver Logan Sharp Redhead Productions. Disqualify. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Welcome to the Nimenati, 
Welcome to the Nimenati. Make sure when you get the chance, you go to nimenvip.com. Um, that's going to redirect you to our members only Facebook group if that's something that you're interested in joining. Um, if you can do that before the stream is finished, I can get you in there as soon as the stream is complete. Just make sure you fill out everything because if you don't have everything filled out, then I just delete them. Um, and also, if you're a Discord user, user, we have our community Discord, which Chantel dropped in here a little bit ago. I think it's in the description also. Yeah, it's right there. Um, so if you uh, are a Discord user, then we also have a members-only section in Discord uh, also. And within that particular thing, one of the thing, um, one of the thing that uh, one of the things that is cool there is there's actually a dedicated questions area. So when I go in there, usually I just hit that questions area, and then I'll just do like a little bit of chat, you know, back and forth or whatever. But it's usually that questions area that I'll hit first, um, just so I can make sure everybody's questions are getting sorted. Um, Renee says, I think sometimes, depending on how long it's been private for, it can take a bit to repopulate comments, but that may be fixed as well. I'll check. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Jerry says the disqualified sound lines up um, just in case he gets out of hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on you, Jerry. <laughs> All right, so next up, we've got... Uh, uh, Ripcord is our next channel here. Uh, they do gaming content. The goal of the channel is to entertain and inform. The question is, how do you recommend a channel that's in a slump with their current content switch to another type of content that's somewhat similar? Um, if you are enjoying the content that you're making and there is still a market for that content in terms of people are still interested in the thing that you're talking about, then in that particular case, I would actually work on the videos themselves. Um, it might not be the actual, you know, the, the slump might not necessarily be, you know, that the... Um, you know, the, the content itself isn't something that's popular. It might be that people are just not responding, you know, uh, competitively to the content that you're publishing. And if they're not responding competitively to the content that you're publishing, then of course, it's not going to perform well in the system against a bunch of other content that is competitive. So because of that, I would go into your analytics. I would look at your audience retention reports on your videos. I would look through at the click-through rate on your videos um, and, and just see, like, how are people responding to what it is that I'm doing? And you might find that if you look in your audience retention reports that people might be abandoning your videos you know relatively quick maybe not but um but you might find that um and if you do then that means that you know you got to get to work on you know the videos creating better hooks creating videos that have just a, a broader topic of interest but are still within you know your your gaming uh you know um theme of your channel that type of thing um but basically you know usually when something unper underperforms or the channel's in a slump it usually just comes down to the content decisions you know around the creator um or the videos that are that are being published um, let's see here. So next up, we've got Cast Plays. They do daily content. Um, they also have a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is to be a professional YouTuber slash content creator. And the question is, so I went nine years without anything on my main to now 500,000 um, in a month. Is that a good pace? I went nine years without anything on my main to now 500,000 in five months. Is that good? So you're getting 100 or you're getting... 100,000 subscribers a month, yeah, I would say that's fantastic. If you're talking about video views, it's still fantastic. Like, um, you know, if you went from not doing, oh, okay, yeah, it's video views. So if you've went from like not getting a response to like, hey, now we're starting to get a response, then yeah, you're heading in the right direction. Um, I'm looking at your channel and I see that you're uploading a lot of short videos that are, uh, that are, let me just confirm. You're uploading a lot of short videos in landscape mode. I recommend that you start publishing those vertically because you don't want to put out a 47 second landscape video. Um, that is just like a game highlight. That's that content is better suited for YouTube shorts. I mean, you can do it if you want, but I'm just saying, if you want to get the most out of those videos, um, I would make those in shorts. I would also be, um, I would also pay attention to making sure that everything that you publish on your channel um, is targeted towards the people that you're trying to serve around the games that you're playing, um, which it looks like are survival and FPS game uh, games. So what I'm seeing right now is I look at your shorts uh, tab and I see that you're putting out like cat videos also. So, you know, like, like one thing that can be extremely helpful for content creators is focus, right? Like, hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make content for these types of people. 
And when you do that, um, then everything on your channel starts to make sense for anybody that interacts with that channel. So for example, if I were to interact with your channel now around one of your short pieces of gaming content, and I'm like, oh, that was hilarious. And I subscribe and I want to watch more. Well, if YouTube ends up showing me one of those videos with a cat on it, then I'm, I'm probably, I'm not going to watch that, right? And then that's going to tell YouTube that I'm not interested in that content anymore. And if they, if they show me another cat video from you and I don't respond to that one too, then YouTube's probably going to stop showing me your content because I'm not responding to any of the content of yours that it's showing to me. So because of that, when you're like, hey, I'm making videos about these games. So then everything that I publish on my channel is going to be about these games. When people start interacting with that content, then as YouTube is showing it to showing more of your content to that viewer, then they're likely more likely to engage with more of your content. And as they engage with more of your content, YouTube is likely to detect that and then start showing your content to other people like them. Right. That's how you that's how you, you know, really create a thriving, successful channel on YouTube. So um, so I recommend just getting clear on who it is you're trying to serve. Yeah, Renee Ritchie says, Ryan George used to do incredible 40-second videos, but has switched those to shorts as well. Ryan George. I haven't watched Ryan George in a while. So much good content. Like, I, I'm, I'm actually going gonna, gonna to open Ryan George up in another tab just so I can do some binging here after the uh, stream. Like, no joke. I'm actually uh, putting that in here right now. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so uh, next up on the list, let me make sure I mute this in case there's a trailer or something. Okay, so next up, We've got Game Punk. Game Punk does daily content one year or more. It's a, also a gaming channel, monetization. And it says, hey, Nick, I just want to clarify something as I noticed in my revenue analytics. It mentions that I got this specific amount when I check my RPMs for each video I uploaded. And that specific amount is equivalent for 1,000 views. So does this mean that if my viewers skip or finish watching the ads for my videos, no longer affects uh, my income for the specific video? As long as it hits 1,000 views, then just multiply that specific amount by my RPM. Um, if I reached more than 1,000 views, thanks for the response. <clears throat> okay. If the viewers skip or finish watching my videos, it no longer affects my income for that specific video as long as it hits 1,000 views and then just multiply that specific amount from my RPM. Yeah, so they're actually doing all that math for you as well. So like you're, you're going to see all of that, you know, in, your, uh, in the back end of your channel. So you're going to see all of that, you know, um, being displayed in your back end anyway. But yeah, I, I think how you have this, I'm, I'm, it's not crystal clear to me in terms of how this is spelled out. But yeah, I think I think you have I think you're on the I think you're on the right path here. So next up, we've got number 37, by the way. Gamer Girl Central is our next channel. They do daily content. Um, it's a gaming channel also. We're in like a we're in like a, a gaming thing here today. Um, for these last few questions. The goal of the channel is mostly because I enjoy it, but I want to eventually grow enough to make money from YouTube. The question is, hello, I just got back into YouTube after uh, waiting on a capture card so I could make better videos. This capture card works well and I use OBS with it. My laptop is about nine years old at this point, but it still runs fine for what I need it for. My videos seem to turn out really well until I uploaded them and realized the game audio has a stuttering sound on the video um, affecting or video, everything else is working fine on the video, but that, any idea on what could be causing the audio stuttering and if there's a way to fix or prevent this in future videos. Um, so um, if your audio is stuttering, so the very first thing is open your videos up before you upload them to YouTube. Make sure that everything is good on them before you um, upload them. Um, if your audio is stuttering, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head would be either a connection from like your microphone um, to where you know something wasn't like fully plugged in or something like that or a processing problem. So you mentioned that you do have like an older computer. So even though it's handling everything well visually, the place that it might be failing could be the audio, right through the audio card or wh wherever it is that you're pulling the audio in from. Um, it could be from that um, to where maybe while it's processing things that it's you know doing fine on the video side, but it's, it's kind of struggling there. Um, so in terms of fixing that, one thing that I would experiment with um, just to see if that's the problem is, um, is, is try to record something which is like a black screen where it's not really like doing much and see if you still get the audio problem there try to record just the audio itself and see if you get a problem um jerry pop andrea says that you might have frame rate incompatibility so basically if, let's say that you're streaming your game at like uh, you're recording it at like 60 frames but then you're recording your audio at 30 then yeah that could cause that problem too thank you for that so you have uh those types of things. We got no clip um, here. They said to check your audio bit rate. So that might be something to look into um, also. And then Eric Waite Whiskey Study says that it could also be a glitch in the matrix. 
<laughs> so yeah, so hopefully one of those outside of the glitch, the glitch in the matrix, hopefully one of those, uh, you know, will we'll get you sorted in terms of a place to troubleshoot. Those, those types of things are super frustrating, right? Because you're like, man, I got, you know, I got this video done, everything's great, but then your audio is like choppy and it's like, oh man. Yeah, so, so I understand the frustration. I wish I could tell you like, hey, just, this is the problem, but you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables. So unfortunately, hopefully some of those things other people recommended, um, hopefully those will get you sorted. Um, Derek J reacts is our next channel here. Derek J reacts. Uh, they do daily content. Um, they've been on YouTube for less than six months. It's a reaction channel where they react to body cam videos. The goal of the channel is to help people not make the same mistakes as others that get them arrested. And the question is, I grew my channel to 600 subscribers in less than 90 days. I find this bump to you. Nice work. It says, I have ideas for two more channels. At what point should I start working on a second channel? Your call. You can start working on a second channel anytime you want. But here's something I want you to know. When you start working on that second channel, keep in mind that everything that works, um, um, like if you're getting into the, into the details of your channel and what causes videos to perform well and not perform well and the things that people respond to in terms of, you know, when you start your videos and the things that keep people watching and things like that. The things that apply to your body cam videos, some of those things will cross over to the other channels that you do, but not everything. It's important to look at each channel differently because they're going to have different audiences for them. So every audience responds to things a little bit differently, and there's a lot of nuance within that. So because of that, don't look at it as like, okay, this is just a crossover. So if I just do this in the video, then it's going to work across the board. Like there are best practice stuff that best practice things that you do there, like, you know, making sure you have a hook in your video or something that grabs their attention at the beginning, stuff like that. Structurally, you know, there are those things, but, um, but in terms of like the very specifics, those are the things that, uh, uh, that, you know, that, that, that are likely to be a little bit different, you know, on each channel. So just make sure that you're mindful of that. But if you have the bandwidth or the time to do multiples, then you can do that at any time. But what I do recommend is I do recommend that you are, you know, making sure that you are giving the original channel, you know, the time that you need, because what can happen is like, you can be like, okay, I got this one to 600 subscribers in like a couple of months. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open like two more channels. Um, in that particular case, you're going to increase your workload, which then might um, uh, limit the amount of time that you have to like learn how to edit better or to, you know, spend time like learning how to present the information better or, you know, making the video production itself better if that's something that, you know, that you care about or that is important for your content. Um, those types of things. So as long as you can reserve, you know, the time for the improvement stuff, then in that particular case, then, you know, you could open as many channels as you want. But if you're like, yeah, my time is kind of tight and this would take away from me, like, you know, really, you know, learning the meat of what it is that I'm doing, then in that case, I would, you know, just do one maybe. Um, and then just kind of see how that balances into everything else that you're doing and then get both channels flowing smoothly in terms of your workflow in order to continually publish content on a regular basis to both of them. Um, and then expand from there as long as you can handle that workload. Because if you start doing too much, I'm sure you've seen plenty of videos or, you know, plenty of things about where content creators burn out and all that. A lot of it can come from just trying to do too much, you know, um, just trying to do too much in general, but also trying to do too much too fast can also, you know, cause that to happen. But by all means, if you're like, yeah, I'm going for it um, and I, 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 I'll figure out how to do it, then, you know, there's definitely a time and place for that too. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, just, you know yourself the best. So if you think you can, you know, that you can dedicate the time that you need to everything and also have the time to improve, then, then absolutely. So really quick, uh, Reefin 3D Design says, I run a channel called Reef Hub. Do you have a recommendation on lens kits to filter out blue light? So for uh, DSLR cameras, I don't know, but I do know that GoPros, that uh, GoPro, they do make a lens for that. Um, for like underwater video and stuff, they do make one of those lenses. Um, so I would look into, I would look into that. Explore Norway is our next channel. If you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. Explore Norway is our next channel. They do travel advice about Norway. The goal of the channel is to help people plan their vacation. And the question is, uploading every, every second week normally with more in season and less uh, in low season, mostly search-based. For some location, I'm the number one in search results, but for some, the most popular destination sites, I have to compete with travel influencers, which just tell random facts, butcher all place names, don't come to the point, give bad or even dangerous advice, or even do illegal stuff, mostly flying drones in for, uh, forbidden places. How can I rank up in the search result? 
The reason that you're seeing those videos, and this is a this is a this is a, 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 fr- a can be a frustrating thing as a creator. So it's important to remember that the platform prioritizes the viewers, right? So we make content for the viewers of the platform. So when you are interacting with like YouTube search, as an example, the things that are at the top of search are the are the videos that are at the top of YouTube search are the videos that drive the most engagement for those particular search terms. So if it's not videos like videos that you make, then in that particular case, you might want to go after different search terms. So like, for example, if it's just like, you know, uh, things to do in Norway, well, in that particular case, you know, there might be, uh, you know, uh, you know, drone videos or, you know, whatever in there. Um, but in that particular case, if it's not content, that is exactly like the content that you make but people are still responding to it there, then YouTube will continue to show that content there. So what you can do is you can still make content targeting that term. You might end up lower down on the results, but if people are sitting there and they're going through the results, they're like, this isn't what I'm looking for. This isn't what I'm looking for. They can still find you there. Um, And then if they find you there, and if enough people find you and they start responding to you there at a rate that's more competitive than the other people that are putting content out that are not in alignment with what it is that you're doing, if they start responding to yours better, then you'll start writing through the ranks over time. Um, so because of that, you know, I would consider that. But another thing, and this is a, a, a big elephant in the room with this conversation, that is really important to understand is, is yes, when it comes to search, it definitely has its place. And with travel content, you know, optimizing stuff, you know, stuff for search is great because then if people are looking for it, they can find you. Um, but with YouTube systems, one of the awesome things about it is one of the things that it uses when it comes to recommendations is what people are searching for. So it's looking at like, okay, what device are they watching on? What time of day is it? Where they're at? How do they typically interact with YouTube at this moment in time? Um, uh, What type of content do they typically watch? What do they don't watch? When they do watch it, you know, what are they most, you know, engage with the most or watch the longest, whatever? Um, What do they share? You know, it's like all these different, you know, factors. But one of those factors is what they search for. So if people are searching for things about Norway, and this is, you know, just something to consider when people are searching for things about Norway, if you're making those videos that are targeted for different search terms around, you know, Norway, that's fine. But when people start searching for those, as long as when they search for those and YouTube recommends your content, if people respond to your content, then you could end up to where if people start searching around for different things around Norway, then YouTube will just start recommending your content to them. You can see this action in, in action for yourself, everybody here on your own channel, if you go and you start looking in YouTube search, and you start looking for things and you start actively looking like, okay, I'm looking for this and I'm going to do like a variation of it. I'm going to click and I'm going to watch this video on this thing. Like anytime you're interested in something new and you go and you search for it and start watching videos on it, you're going to notice YouTube starts recommending you content similar to those videos that you are searching for, right? The reason for that is because they're using that as part of their, you know, part of their um, uh, uh, factors for tuning the recommendation system to help give viewers what it is that they want. So the play is, if somebody's watching, uh, if they're searching for stuff about Norway, let's start recommending some stuff, some content to them about Norway because they're clearly, you know, interested in Norway right now. So because of that, try to get your videos to show up in search for the terms that you care about. Um, Try to get your videos to show up in search for things that aren't as competitive for those other things because again, YouTube is showing the content there that people are responding to there. Keep in mind, that YouTube also adjusts the search results per viewer. So there's some things that will just lock in there, right? That that they always get a response and they'll lock them in there. But like if you look for those same search results where you're ranking number one, if you look at those from your account, then you might see a different result than if you look at them from another account, from somebody that has never looked like a friend of yours or something like that. If they've never looked at anything about Norway and then you go there and you search, you you might find that you're number one or you might find that you don't even show up, right? So it can be wildly different, um, you know, for for per different YouTube account because those are also customized uh, to the viewer. So yes, without question, you know, you can still get placements. Um, but you know, those placements are flexible, um, so to speak, you know, per viewer next up number 40 here, loving it. So we got uh silver Logan sharp redhead productions. Uh, the type of channel, um, is monetized YouTube studio. I don't know if I answered this question correctly. Um, that was actually like the genre of content. (laughs) So, uh, Hey, really quick, Renee Ritchie um, also mentions, he says, YouTube ranks based on both performance video versus other videos and personalization based on how you specifically interact. Boom. 
Um, but the goal of the channel here, it says uh, my podcast is um, called Feel Better Friday. It's a music talk show where I interview and showcase artists and they perform live with my band. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, we're using a technology that allowed musicians to play together from multiple locations over the internet with no latency. We also use green screen technology and had people from all over the world performing with us. I'm now revamping those videos into shorter episodes and just want to get more views. Um, and I do this to use live music to help the world literally feel better. The question is, is posting once a week enough or should I figure out a way to go live on YouTube as well and point slash encourage people to check out my content? Um, yes, publishing one one video per week is perfectly fine. Um, but keep in mind when you're publishing that one video per week, um, it's all going to come down to how people respond to it. So if it's put together in a way to where people click on it and they come in and they watch it and they're like, Oh wow, this is amazing. Then in that case, it's going to do well. If they click on it and they, and they come into the video and they're like, what's this? They don't have any context when it starts. And it's just kind of like, you know, people are tuning instruments and stuff like that. Um, and it's just kind of like awkward when they come into the video and they don't really know what's going on. Then in that particular case, you know, it might not, you know, it might not do great. So, um, so I would just make sure that you're looking at the content as you're putting it together through the lens of a viewer, through the eyes of a viewer and think to yourself, okay, if I were to just show up, if I didn't know anything about my channel and I click on this video, do this in the editing process, not after you publish. If I, you know, were to click on this video and, and, and I get this experience that I'm editing right now, would I have any, would I have any context, right? Would I stick around and actually, and actually watch this, right? Um, just run, run it through, run it through that. Um, let's see here. Um, in terms of, uh, going live, um, that is something that I would do. So if you're doing anything music related, I would definitely be doing it in shorts content because then that way, in addition to the long form, because then that way it gets you, you know, in front of people that might not have clicked, which is a win. Um, same thing with the live, you know, you can go live vertically now on YouTube. Like right now during the stream, I've had roughly like it jumped up to like, um, I think almost 200 vertical, you know, live stream viewers and then down into like, you know, right now it's at like 85, just jumped up to 105 again. So it's like all over the place, but, um, this is getting in front of, you know, new people that haven't experienced my content before. So, uh, so that's a, that's a win when it comes to vertical live streaming. By the way, if you are watching this in the in the short shelf right now, um, if you're watching this, if you were watching YouTube shorts and this showed up for you, um, if you are a YouTube content creator, I help content creators thrive on YouTube. So if that's something that you're interested in, then make sure you subscribe to the channel and watch my long videos too, because that's where the real the real stuff is at. Um, there and these live streams too. These live streams actually a lot of really good information comes out of these. So uh, Poodle Professor um, is our next channel here. They upload one time per week or more. Um, they do outdoors, camping, and hiking with their standard poodles. The goal of the, the, goal of the channel is to eventually go full-time and make money. The question is, should I stick with my channel name? I'm, I'm a professor and I have poodles, but the channel name doesn't reflect the content. I um, started with the name on IG, so I stayed with it. Um, it's fine. Like Poodle Professor, I think it's okay. Like the whole thing is you're doing, you know, outdoor camping and hiking with the poodles. So, you know, maybe like if you wanted to change it to, you know, like start building like a brand around, you know, what it is that you do, then in that particular case, I mean, you could change it to something about, you know, poodles and camping or, you know, something like that. Um, but really, when it comes to the channel name, it's just something that you, people can remember you by. The thing that is actually going to bring people into your content is the content itself, right? So if the content's good, then it's going to be fine. Um, but if you did want to give yourself that like, hey, I want to build like an internet brand uh, around poodles and camping and I don't want it to be Poodle Professor and I want it to be just crystal clear that if somebody says my channel name to somebody that doesn't know anything about my channel, that they'll instantly know what my channel is about right there, um, then in that case, you know, you could definitely do that too. But your biggest wins are going to come from just people clicking on your videos. Bankroll is the uh, next channel name here. They have a gaming channel. The goal is to make it a career. And the question is, my video I think is good, but my videos, uh, but is my video up to par? The way that you know your video is up to par is your videos will start performing in YouTube system. And what I mean by that is YouTube is showing your videos to people. So when you publish your video, they might show your video to 100 people. It might be 1,000 people. It might be 100,000 people, a million people. It's all going to depend on how different groups of people respond. So when you first publish your video, if those people respond well to it, then it's going to get in front of more people faster. Um, if they don't respond well to it, then it's still going to get in front of more people, but the process is going to be much slower. It might pick up later. It might not. Um, but everything is, you're basically going to live and die by, by how people respond to your, uh, to your videos. And one thing that you can do, um, if you want to know how your videos are competing against other videos of similar length is for every video you publish on YouTube, 
there's something called an audience retention report. We get that inside of our YouTube analytics, which are our stats for our YouTube channel. So in your uh, YouTube analytics or in your creator studio, if you go in, you click into any one of your videos, and then you click into your analytics. Um, when you scroll down the page, you're going to see your audience retention report. Um, if you click into that and you click on the little see more, then once you go into that, you have a drop down that you can pick if you're on a computer. Um, in that drop down, um, you can choose compared to other videos. And right there, you'll be able to see how competitive is my video and different parts of your video, how competitive it is it um, against other videos of similar length. Next, we got the Hotel Hunter. Hotel Hunter uploads one time per week or more. They have a Samsung Galaxy. Um, it's a hotel reviewing channel. The goal of the channel is full-time YouTube if possible. The question is, hey, Nick, my channel's almost 10,000 subscribers in five months. You are crushing. High five, fist bump to you. Nice work. Says, um, if I make long videos like 50 minutes and 20 minute videos, will YouTube still share my videos as normal? Everything is based on response. So if people are responding to your 50 minute videos, they'll show those videos to people and keep showing them to people as long as they keep responding. If you publish a five minute video and people respond to that video, then YouTube will also continue showing that to people as long as people continue to respond. So everything, like the entire system is response based. So if you publish something and people are interacting with it a lot and they're enjoying that experience, then YouTube is going to continue to show your content to more people. As soon as it hits groups of people that are not enjoying it you know, as much, then that's where everything starts to slow down. Next up, number 44, we've got FTO from the outside, true crime. Um, the type of channel is a true crime channel. The goal is to grow enough to make money on YouTube. The question is, I want to make my content interactive, but I tell the whole story during the same video. For example, I can't ask the audience, who do you think the killer is? Because I tell them in the video. So do you have any suggestions if I didn't confuse you too much? So um, one thing that I would do is as you're telling the story, maybe drop it in there and be like, you know, before you tell them at the end who it is, um, as you are, you know, talking about it, um, then if you tell them at, at, at first, then maybe reserve that later. Um, but uh if you don't, then maybe sprinkle it in somewhere. So let's say it's a 10 minute video, um, maybe around the five minute mark as you're telling this and you've built different characters into the story or whatever, um, then ask them at that point. Say, hey, you know, before we get, you know, before I reveal who this person is, so far, let me know who you think, you know, the, the who you think that person is. Um, and then uh, if you tell them right out, right up front, um, and you want to ask them a question in the comments, then in that particular case, um, I would maybe start asking them around the scenario in terms of like, you know, like if you were on the other side of this, or if you were a family member, what would you think if this happened to somebody in your family? Or, you know, if they were the assaulter, you know, what would you do in that situation? Or, you know, whatever. Um, but basically asking those types of questions, I think might be the way to get people to engage. But the whole thing is just asking the questions, right? All right. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take some questions directly out of the chat because I know, you know, some people, they just showed up. Um, and because of that, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to get their question in the form. They might not even know the form is there. Um, and we just ran out. I just cleared the form. Um, so we just ran out of the questions here in the forum, which is great. We got through 44 responses today um, or 44 questions, which is fantastic. Um, high five and fist bump to us, right? To all of us here today for uh, cru cruising through those. But if you do have a question, um, make sure you just put a Q in front of your question. And, um, and I'm going to take them from both places. So if you put a Q in front of it, that lets me know that it's a question for me. Um, and then it's not just a side conversation happening in the chat. And I'm just going to try to crush through as many of these in the shortest answer that I possibly can, which can be a challenge for me because I'm a bit talky. But, um, but I'm going to, you know, but I'm just going to answer some, uh, you know, some right here out of the, uh, out of the chat. If anybody has any questions, maybe they don't. Here we go. Okay, so $1 American, this is on the vertical side, says um, YouTube stole me 1,200 hours of my watch time. What happened? So either you deleted videos or you made your videos private or unlisted and it removed the watch time from those or you have been making videos for uh, more than a year and the, the watch time from 366 days prior, um, all of that has been taken off because it's a rolling watch time. Um, or because YouTube does verify views and it verifies all the activity um, on channels. So another thing that could happen is, you know, let's say, uh, you know, if somebody, uh, you, you didn't do it, but let's say somebody else bought, you know, views from your channel or something like that, and there are a lot of bots or something like that interacting with it, then it can also take that kind of stuff away. 
Um, let's see here, looking for the cues. What camera are you using right now? So for this one, I'm using a Sony um, A7S III with a 35 millimeter G Master lens on it. Uh, great setup. I love it. I, I like the 24 millimeter too. Uh, that that with the 24 millimeter, it also shows the desk and stuff. Um, but with this one, um, I like this one because uh, when I use the teleprompter, it's not as obvious for whatever reason than the, than the other one is. For the vertical, I'm using a Sony um, A6500 with a Sigma 16 millimeter 1.4 on that one. To the vertical, um, we've got. Let's see here. Let me get this mouse here. And again, I'm just looking for those cues. I have a low end laptop, um, but want to make videos. What can I do? Learn how to make them on your phone. So, uh, Mr. Beast, if you're familiar with him, he started with his iPhone and he didn't, he didn't upgrade until he made over 100,000 subscribers. I have a friend of mine here in Thailand. He got over 100,000 subscribers in 10 months just using his iPhone with no additional microphone, anything like that, just running around vlogging. Um, so you can absolutely do it with the phone. Don't look at it as a limitation. Look at it as like, hey, this is great. I can I can actually take the camera with me and I always have it with me so I can make content anytime I want. Um, um, don't look at it as a limitation. If you look at it as a limitation, it's going to be one. If you look at it like, hey, this is what I got and I'm gonna figure out how to make it work, then that's what you're gonna do. Um, let's see here, looking for any questions. Okay, so we have some. Uh, will we be transferred to Dean Daniel's stream? Um, yes, you will. Um, as soon as this stream is finished, uh, you will be heading over to there um, just automatically. Desi Fitness says, hey, Nick, I'm getting um, emails from YouTube saying they have muted and unlisted my YouTube short and it will be deleted within 30 days. What can I do about that? Um, if they've muted it because of copyright reasons, then in that particular case, um, you are, uh, you are, you know, you're just going to have to take the L on that one unless you had permission to use the music. In that case, then you can dispute it. Um, Let's see here. So Project Equestrian says, in external traffic, Google search, is there a way to see what terms brought the traffic? I had a video pop off um, with that as a primary traffic source, um, but is now pulling in suggested and browse. So with Google external, um, no, I, I don't think that you can see the Google external. You can see it on YouTube, but for Google external, I don't think that you can see the, the, the keywords for that one. Yeah, Renee Ritchie says that MKBHD's autofocus channel is also all shot on a phone. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's good to know. I can use that one. I can, I'll store that one for later. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Looking at the vertical side here real quick. Uh, says, I make chemistry content, uh, which is niche. I have trouble getting a retention in shorts because not everyone likes chemistry. What do I do? So if you want to do both, if you're interested in doing both, then I would do just really quick, short, uh, you know, just really quick information in shorts grab their attention when they come in, talk about things that relate to everybody. So talk about things about like, you know, like, you know, your health or, you know, just general things in society, things that, you know, matter to pretty much everybody to where it's like, hey, this video is about you in some way, right? That will open it up to more uh, general. So you do chemistry. So talking about dim di different chemistry stuff within the body, you know, the chemistry within coffee that people drink, the chemistry within, you know, food that people eat, stuff like that. Um, you know, then that way it's like, did you know that this is, uh, you know, that this is, uh, you know, this food that you're eating has, you know, whatever this is in it and this is how it works and blah, blah, that type of thing. Um, when it comes to the long form content, you say that you're having tr trouble with retention. Uh, don't worry about that in terms of, uh, you know, not making content because of it. Use that information to learn how to make better content, right? Because if you're making content and people aren't responding well, it just means that you got to learn how to grab their attention better and actually bring them through what it is that you're doing better. It's part of the process. Don't stress out about it. Just embrace it as part of the process and learn how to work around it. So on that note, I want to thank everybody for hanging out here. I do want to remind you, if you are a new content creator and you're just getting started with all this, which I know a lot of people here are, YouTube is a learning curve or it comes with a learning curve, just like anything else that you're going to do, just like playing an instrument, just like playing a sport. You know, as soon as you come onto YouTube, you're immediately competing with the best creators on the platform. So because of that, you have to, you know, make sure that you're like, okay, 
that's the game that I'm playing. So because of that, I need to learn how to make videos the best that I possibly can for the people that I'm trying to reach. And I understand that that's a learning process and I'm going to embrace that. And I'm not going to beat myself up if my next video isn't the best video, you know, on my channel. Instead, I'm going to use it as a learning thing. And I'm going to say, okay, this video didn't do well. Why do I think it didn't do well? What could I have done better? And I'm going to do that with every piece of video that I, or every video that I publish to YouTube, regardless of the format. And I'm going to continue that process and learn to develop my skills of editing and communication and making thumbnails and photography and videography. If you're making, you know, content that needs to be produced, um, and, and embrace learning the skills and serving your audience. If you focus on embracing the learning curve, learning your the skills required and, and, and serving the audience that you're making with your content, you'll be fine. Um, but if you are like, hey, this has to happen tomorrow, um, in that particular case, you're gonna cause yourself a ton of stress that's completely unnecessary. So because of that, just focus on building your skill sets and you'll be fine. Um, for those of you that are hanging out in the landscape experience, I'm gonna stay live over here on the vertical for just a little bit. But um, for the landscape, um, as soon as I hit the end button here, um, it's going to send you over to uh, my brother and uh, my brother D and uh, Daniel Battelle's live stream where they're doing channel reviews. So if that's something that you're interested in, if you want somebody to give you feedback on your YouTube channel, make sure that you stick around for that and you go check that out. Um, also, I'm going to be doing channel reviews on the Tube Spanner YouTube channel um, coming up this week. So make sure that you're subscribed to that as well. And um, everybody have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, I hope you got some type of value out of the conversation today. Hit the like button on your way out and um, I will see you next time.